Section one of First from the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. First from the Front by Harold Ashton, War Correspondent of the Daily News. Introduction and chapters one and two in this brief book i have lifted a very small corner of the curtain of war to tell of my adventures a week in the north sea and a breathless score of days in northern france i have touched upon both tragedy and comedy as they came my way the tragedy is terrible enough. I have put it down plainly and unvarnished. From tragedy to comedy, it is but a step. Along the gloomiest corridor of life, one sees the flash of the cap and hears the rattle of the bells. Otherwise, it would be unbearable and if my little bell would seem to jangle out of tune i cannot help it the bell was there now and again it rang and some of us smiled at the music of it signed harold ashton london autumn nineteen fourteen chapter one looking for trouble I am dreaming over Walter Pater's exquisite cameo of Denis Loxeroy when the telegram comes, whisking me off to the world of war. No more dreams. A rush and a scramble to catch the flying Scotsman. No time for the elaborate kit of the war correspondent of fiction. A jumble of soldiers scrambling like me into the train everything excitement everybody eager the train settling speedily down to grim business presently roaring northward through the dreamy sunny water meadows of the green midlands halting impatiently at york and doncaster and newcastle to pick up more soldiers who tumble into the train buttoning up their new tunics wrestling with their bright brown leather straps all keen avid the blood races with the racing train my pulses are jumping as we hum along the great game is beginning adventure is afoot even now as we cross the border swinging by brown jagged old castles with the scars of ancient battles still showing upon rampart and turret the first clang of the tocsin may be ringing across the plateau of the north sea and the german warlord flinging his grim battle line of fighting ships across and across to our anxious coastline the talk in the train is all war talk the mildest passenger with his rug round his knees and his gold pince nez trembling on his nose thumps his tea basket and argues passionately on tactics strategy gun calibre submarines torpedoes admirals butterflies were his hobby until an hour or so ago and now as we swing into the north british station at edinburgh dragonflies even dragons would not satisfy him he has caught the fever like all of us in edinburgh most glorious of cities to me the battle picture spreads out alluringly princes street in the bright evening shine is alive with soldiery and ringing with cheers as the highland regiments march by their kilted knees rising and falling rhythmically to the magic music of the pipes 
a long slim racing car awaits me at the station it flashes me in next to no time to ross Ith, the naval base and i am among my old comrades of the navy once again what a race it has been from london town a few hours ago dreaming with dear delightful dennis in a sunny garden in maida vale and now the fourth bridge towering its majestic heights overhead its traffic held up and khaki sentinels marching slowly with drawn bayonets along the forefoot way tiny little men with bayonets no bigger than needles at that great height lilliputians of war and under the bridge and away steering for the open sea that sea which means so much to us now line after line of destroyers leaving rolling thunderstorms or black smoke behind them so the evening closes in mysteriously and as night comes up her black curtain pierced with countless millions of stars we strain our eyes seaward and hear or fancy we hear the dull distant thud of guns the sober truth is that we are all dancing on wires there is a loose latched door at the inn of the two fighting cocks in queensferry town and at every bang of it we jump many days passed in this manner days of rumour and nights of rumour particularly nights a handy carpenter mended the slamming door of the two fighting cocks and i awoke one bright morning to find that the fleet had vanished the fourth was clear of fighting ships clear absolutely and fishing boats coming in from the north sea reported from that area too a significant emptiness they had sailed long and far these dour fisher folk looking for the fleet they had not even been able to spy a smudge of smoke on the horizon strange several of these boats had not returned stranger still for there was neither fog nor tempest in the north sea just now but placid days starry clear nights and an ocean calm enough to make a hammock for the halcyon bird to dream and rock in one lovely afternoon i motored out to north berwick and talked with a group of the trawlermen there any news of your fellows i asked no said they with a gloomy shake of the head and what does that mean mine sir and nay a doot aboot it the cross sea cargo boots have been warned the mine sweepers are out we've spied them more days of restless waiting for something to happen never a word never a whisper from jellico with his great ships and his great-hearted men away out there in the gathering mists all wireless dismantled a seaplane soaring significantly hither and thither over the fretting forth but seaplanes like seagulls do not tell tales already the greatest war of all time was flaming and thudding in belgium in france when oh when would the guns clamour at sea what was happening out there over toward the grim grey rock of heligoland there was just a chance of getting across one and then another ship had crept in from scandinavian ports a certain line was supposed to be clear and i had met a rare tremendous viking of a skipper down in an alleyway behind leith docks 
a sailor to warm the heart of any man over tall slim glasses of stinging schnapps i can taste the blazing liquor still we bargained for the trip in the little cargo steamer which had just come into port mysteriously secretly packed with bacon from one of the small corners of northern europe unbothered for the time anyway by the fierce troubles of war the silver star was this dauntless little ship's name her commander was a man of few words i'll take you back again said he clinching the bargain with a goliath grip of his huge hairy fist you want to see the british fighting fleet well you will see it no doubt and possibly the german ships too we will run for heligoland sir or somewhere near it maybe take a peep out of the corner of our eyes for a bit of the keel canal what about the mines i asked mines said he i guess we can steer clear of them i have marked out a course on the chart it is free of fireworks that concludes chapter one of first from the front the section continues with chapter two running the gauntlet the silver star lay alongside the wharf in leith dock with her red funnel smoking her decks all a-glistening with crystals of brine and the whole fabric of her reeking like a bacon shop on a hot saturday night a swarm of grimy men half naked dead-eyed and hoarse with fatigue ran in and out of her the overworked donkey engine clattered and clamoured the derrick swung backward and forward and at every swing hauled out from the hold eight whole carcasses of pig the carcasses were flung on to the quay thudding and showering brine-like spray over a sore-eyed territorial whose thankless job it was to guard this business with a fixed bayonet and ten rounds of ball cartridge in his pouch four thousand pounds worth of bacon and butter was heaved out of the holds of this danish food ship to say nothing of innumerable cases of eggs as well then this wholesale menu for the british breakfast table was pitched into a special train with extraordinary speed and sent full speed southward Thuh! gasped the territorial wiping the salt out of his stinging eyes i'll never stick my teeth into a rasher again as long as i live the captain stood aft by the gangway he was getting up the steam of an enormous cigar whilst the customs officer squatting by his side at a hastily improvised turnstile licked the stump of his indelible pencil and prepared to receive the small stream of passengers three of them only were british an attache from the embassy at berlin and his young wife bound for copenhagen and myself bound for heaven knows where mine was a roving commission i'm awfully sorry to trouble ye said the customs man to me taking another lap at his pencil and disclosing a tongue already brilliantly violet but war is war and this is a proscribed port and if ye will be runnin the gauntlet i mourn ha ye full particulars so aided by the captain who jabbered alternately in russian swedish danish english and scotch the customs man struggled nobly with puzzling barbarous names 
including that of a tall splendid russian with a magnificent sweep of beard and wrote us all down in detail i'll make you a present of a fountain pen on the next trip said the skipper as he waved good-bye to the besmeared official with his twelve point three cheroot and we were off in the blue haze of the night creeping out of the dock dead silent like a cat on the stalk to adventure across the north sea to fetch more bacon for your breakfast and more eggs to fry with it good friends at home we saw many interesting things as we stole off upon this burglarious errand there was a cruiser with steam up and her listening wireless spread from mast to mast hiding craftily behind a tall dockside warehouse with only a scrap of her top hamper visible to our little ship as she warped out of the basin along the sea wall lying perdu also were half a dozen d submarines clean slim grey-skinned sharks fretting to be away at their devilish business their crews sitting on the wall swinging their legs and smoking the little gate at the end of the groin chained and padlocked and guarded by a kilted terrier knees and bayonet naked and there were other things secret things extraordinarily interesting which i may not write of with the eye of the censor still peering over my shoulder but which could tell you if i did how completely how wonderfully the navy was awake to the needs of this little nation of ours we swung out to the open sea under the flaming sword of the revolving light on something island another blade of dazzling silver watching the sea from another and a more distant island leapt out of the night and as these two whirling weapons met under the blue-black canopy of heaven one seemed to hear the clash supper was served at ten a rich abundance of scandinavian food piled under a comforting cluster of union jacks our viking skipper spite of the smallness of his craft saw to that rations of war said he with a chuckle as he helped himself to an immense plateful of pate the magnificent russian appeared in evening dress and a diamond in his shirt front whereat we all marvelled surely he was a count at the very least but he ate nothing but bread and butter stacks of it the next morning he appeared at breakfast again in his immaculate wardrobe the mystery was solved he had no other clothes one by one the consoling coast lights winked and went out we were alone under the stars flung like diamond dust athwart the sky like a poaching lurcher free at last of the homestead we gathered courage at our lonesomeness and sneaked on full pelt our heels kicking out a smother of white spray behind us so we ran across the north sea until the very stroke of midnight up on the bridge the captain shifted his cigar from port to starboard and sniffed i smell ships he said ships all around and he wagged his smart little grey wisp of beard then a flicker came over the sea a flicker of multitudinous needles of light radiating fanwise from a centre miles and miles away just a flicker and no more darkness again and then from another quarter away on our starboard bow 
another little flirting fan of light and again inky blackness they've seen us said the skipper and tossing his cigar overboard he clapped his hand to the little lever and rung down a ding 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 to the engine room our sea lurcher stuck her back heels into the ocean so to speak and slithered along vibrating at the shock suddenly a terrific explosion of light smote us amidships and stayed there an angry commanding eye of molten silver in the stare of which every detail of our little ship leapt out in amazing clearness i noticed the wart just over the skipper's left eyebrow as though i were examining it through a microscope this great frightening eye rushed down upon us with meteor swiftness and then paused from behind it a voice spoke a calm even gentlemanly very young voice tuned i swear in the marlborough classrooms and not so very long ago either through a megaphone what the hell sir are you in such a hurry for sorry said the captain but we weren't expectin visitors on this trip we're goin to fetch food pigs for leith edinburgh london manchester the eye winked once and from behind it the voice spoke again commanding the skipper to lay by until dawn but we shall miss the morning tide the skipper fretted can't help it was the reply stay where you are until it's light your pilot will be aboard in an hour how in the world did this young cyclops know and your course will be something 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 might as well make it iceland growled the skipper but i guess beggars can't be choosers in these jumpy times iceland it is then as you please mr mr lipton good night the eye closed utter blackness drenched us once again we blinked out over the jet sea saw nothing and only heard the swish of the little nighthawk of war's skirts as she turned and dashed away to spy other where so we lay on the flat sea until the morning not daring to move a waggle of our screw for the swift little patrols were still holding us and flirting their fans over us daintily as though we were a ballroom dame of high degree sitting out a polka instead of a grunty little pig ship carrying a rasher ardent as our house flag the dawn loomed up grey and cold and when the sun at last blazed out we found ourselves in a sea swept clear of everything not even a feather of smoke marked the wide circle of the horizon the night watchers had vanished we sailed the whole day long and saw nothing but an empty biscuit box spotless immaculate the russian count aired himself in the heartening sunshine still in his evening dress at dawn next morning we crawled into the danish port of esbjerg and were received by that neutral community to our astonishment like conquering heroes the local newspaper gave a huge placard to announce our arrival and a young gentleman with a very large notebook interviewed me at great length a little barber from camberwell who had sailed greatly daring with us walked off with his neat bag of razors and a small valise slung at his shoulder to look for customers in one of the small corners of europe 
where at present there is no war and where the wide chin populace have plenty of leisure for the luxury of a regular shave and the russian count having cleaned up his shirt front with breadcrumbs bade us a stately farewell chartered the only taxicab in nesbjerg a huge contraption like an armoured train and whirled off to the railway station to catch the next train for copenhagen that concludes chapter two of first from the front and is also the end of section one section two of first from the front by harold ashton war correspondent of the daily news this librivox recording is in the public domain chapters three and four chapter three the mine sweepers the winds of the north sea carry no tales of what is moving there in esbjerg as in edinburgh it is the same every evening the warm mists roll up over the delectable isle of fainu no longer hilariously gay as it should be at this time of the year with its crowds of rich german seasiders making merry but bleak and glum as an island of the dead deep shadows move shadowed deeper with forebodings and mutterings of martial things every morning the sun climbs up and shows us an empty sea a sea of boundless peace swept clear of alarms and murmuring lazily but at night strange uncanny things are moving phantoms are abroad eerie lights glitter and gleam here across the sky and there athwart the water the swift searchlight comets of the german ships of war brandish their crystal tresses rip livid lightning wounds through the fog and are swallowed into the darkness again the desultory boom of guns from afar tells us that something is happening but what after dinner that too satisfying danish dinner of piled profusion we sit at the open window of the hotel and stare out seaward with wondering eyes carl steals in with the coffee and whispering that the last boat in at the harbour has brought news steals out again to glean the dregs of it on the balcony apart from us all and sitting tense-faced and mute at a little marble-topped table father joseph the pastor gazes out too as we are gazing at the mist which hides the sea but it is not of the sea he is thinking his five stout sons all in honourable employment in sleischweg holstein were swept off to the wars by the germans and placed with other holsteiners in the front of the fighting line and news had come through this day that three of them had been killed outright the heavy door leading to the restaurant swings open with a bang and a polyglot crowd clatters in ragged worn travel-stained half-starved and wholly desperate they jabber in every european language except perhaps english and high above the jabber soars the sing-song plaint of the american tourist thwarted of his pleasure and querulously railing at creation this sort of scene is repeated regularly whenever a boat arrives from one of the scandinavian islands or the copenhagen express flounders in with an extra cattle truck or two hitched on behind to accommodate the human overflow 
Esbjerg just now is a sort of international clearing house for desperate adventurers trying frantically to get into Russia or seeking with equal avidity to get out of it. It is the only way in or out now, with the rest of Europe all seething in the devilish cauldron of war. And never was so piteous a pilgrimage to be seen. The Americans bear the worst of all. At the tail of this boatload of blanched, feckless folk comes the captain shepherding them. He is a Dane, hard, mahogany toned, a sea rover with pirating blood in him, and, like my giant friend of the Silver Star, with very little to say. I never saw eye of clearer blue in any man. The Silver Star has been held up. This new captain sails tomorrow night. Night, or the cold, clammy grey of breaking dawn, sees the beginning of the end of all these trips. He will take me, ya. Yeah. But why? The North Sea, I tell him, is good for a man. It blows health into him. And sometimes it blows him up, says the skipper, with an eruptive jerk of his great brown hands, magnificently descriptive. But I do not think there is danger of mines now. The fishermen have been out after them day after day, and there is talk down at the harbour of twenty-seven hooked and landed. Tomorrow morning, you have near a full day before we sail. Go out and see for yourself. So tomorrow morning, out I venture, with a creepy feeling at the back of my neck, in a sort of lumbering old washing tub, all beam, fitted with a consumptive little motor, and manned by a listless Norwegian and his small son, who is both engineer and navigating officer. It is a dreary business. The sea has a nasty pitch to it, and we flop sickenly over heavy, oily waves, and say never a word but squat all humped and sullen behind the tin splashboard of the stinking, spluttering motor. We swing round by Fainu's sandy and deserted promontory, where the famous golf links lie, and after hours of far niente, anything but dulce, we meet the homeward-bound minesweepers, huge, flat-bottom fishing ships, built with great heaviness against the sudden rages of temper this north sea flies into without warning and rigged very strangely with sails brown and white and patched everywhere like the hinder parts of ancient dutch trousers these lumbering arks with their shallow draught are immune from mines so they can fish for them as though they were no more harmful than mackerel. They hunt in couples, tethered like greyhounds. The leash is a long steel wire tethering ship to ship, and sunk to a certain distance. So, very simply, and fairly safely, is this mine angling done, and when the anchored engine of destruction is hooked, there is a performance something akin to the sudden blowing of a harpooned cachalot. And that is all. But give me mackerel fishing for choice any day. We steered our tub well out of range of the groping hawser, hailed the anglers, sitting humped and nodding over their sport, for all the world, like Broadland Bream Rodsman, and heard from them that they had toiled all day over a cunningly charted course, and had caught nothing. The total bag reported in Esbjerg earlier in the week as seven and twenty, 
was an exaggeration it was seventeen the chartered course we were to sail in the bacon boat tomorrow night was clear of submarine fireworks anyway so we turned the squat nose of our washing tub and coughed home wearily to fainu having raised a quaint corner of the curtain in this bewildering theatre of war men fishing for sudden death with the nonchalance of eel dibbers and smoking and drowsing at their work the night mist was creeping up over the sea the brown sails turned black and the harbour lights were flashing a warning home call to us as the norwegian child tipped the last canful of lubricator into the hoarse throat of the consumptive little engine and stretched himself wearily his father spat over the side into the sea contemptuously that concludes chapter three of first from the front the section continues with chapter four the handyman at home post haste we slapped five hundred tons of breakfast bacon eggs and butter into our hold painted the scandinavian name of our new home-going steamer in black letters a yard high port and starboard on our grey hull so that there should be no mistake in the matter of our identification and warped out of the harbour for england or scotland or as near as we could get across the hazardous highway of the north sea keel perhaps you never know your luck in these adventures the ship stank of bacon the steward gibbered and blabbered through his porthole as he saw land slipping away from him the captain alone of the crew showed any signs of cheerfulness having slept in my clothes for four days i longed for a bath and wandering amid musty corridors i at last to my joy found a latched door labelled bad but the bath was full of bacon our course fixed by the minesweeper's chart was round about and worrying we were obliged to take a wide semicircular sweep of the sea very nearly two hundred miles northward of fainu here at any rate we should miss the mines but the betting was two to one on running into some of the german scouts and sure enough some hours after nightfall we did there was a head wind on and the disturbed sea was battering and hammering all over our steel hull i was sleeping in the saloon on deck away from the choking odour of the two russians who shared my cabin below when i was awakened by the unmistakable popping of guns pop guns it sounded like we were running seventeen knots and settling down to it snugly enough ready for a dirty night i had counted six shots before we condescended to bide our way as we eased up another missile plumped into the sea just ahead of us marking its target with an admiration note of white foam as it fell an inquiring searchlight slapped us full in the face and we pulled up snorting in a minute or two with a very great show of fuss and clatter and ceremony and salutation a german officer boarded us from a panting little box of tricks which we could just see tossing in the darkness below it was quite a state ceremony our captain bared his bullet head and bowed low the officer saluted stiff as a ramrod the scene which followed was sheer undiluted comic opera and not war at all 
our visitor was young and fair with a very red face and light eyes which flickered uncertainly under eyebrows almost white why he demanded first of all hadn't we stopped sooner why had it been necessary to waste nine shots over us the tenth shot would have settled our business once and for all never heard you sooner replied the captain your powder isn't noisy enough but i am sorry to have caused all this unnecessary ceremony we're all right sir we are a neutral ship with cargo chiefly bacon therefore england the german naval officer shook his head no certainly not said he you must take this ship to hamburg here was a pretty lookout our faithful skipper however was equal to the occasion he declared that a trip to hamburg was absolutely impossible just now it would disorganize the whole cargo service of his mightily important fleet of breakfast liners this neutral ship was carrying dead food to england other neutral ships in the same line were carrying live food to germany cows chiefly whose milk long ago had ceased and horses of an age which had rendered them unfit for work do you know he said that since this war began denmark has sent into germany supplies to the value of two and a half million kronen the german officer knew nothing whatever about it he hesitated he scratched his head and in the sway of his indecision the captain's arguments swung him round to the point of view our intelligent skipper was anxious to drive into him well i suppose you must go on said the german at last and the captain again swept off his peaked cap and bowed low tack said he the young gentleman from the destroyer returned the compliment he had his hand on the rail preliminary to clambering down again when another suspicion held him back have you any passengers on board any english said he the skipper did not evidently think it fit to imperil his mortal soul by unnecessary lying do you think sir he said still with his hat in his hand that any passengers would be fools enough to travel a route like this at a time like this but the english are always fools declared the young officer and with this parting shot and more ceremonious bowing he clambered down the slippery sides of our little ship and left us to carry on the remainder of our journey in peace as we gathered way over the slapping sea the destroyer's searchlight followed us with an angry eye watching us reluctantly off the premises there followed a day of hot sunshine and languid calm we slipped along merrily across a halcyon sea seeing nothing and hearing nothing but at night again there were visions about and excursions and alarms upon the lapping water at two in the morning when the captain declared that the way was clear and that we should be no more troubled with ships of war the haze which had enfolded us suddenly lifted and we saw a few miles away the riding lights of british destroyers at first we thought it was land we had sighted but now one pair of lights and then another began to move swiftly passing and repassing one another then 
suddenly as though a commanding finger had flicked down the switch they all went out the captain stopped this time and stopped quick the anchor cable ran out with a roar and scarce had it ceased when a smart little patrol boat came alongside with a fighting crew of three all told on board no ceremony this time no clatter no flap a petty officer swarmed up the rope ladder like a monkey his business with the captain was over in next to no time all right says he carry on any british passengers on board gentlemen asleep on the sofa in the saloon replied the captain the gentleman asleep in the saloon and i was that individual happened to be very widely awake at the moment i slithered out with my naked feet on a cold damp deck to greet this young man of the sea papers all in order sir said the petty officer they were and may i be so bold as to ask what you are doing on this trip i assured him that i hadn't the slightest idea and he laughed well and how are you all over there i asked pointing into the darkness where a little time back the ships had been winking to one another oh we're all right said he fit enough but bored this is a slow game any news of anything we're just waiting i told him all i knew and that was a week old and more and scrappy have you got anything to read sir any old thing that you don't happen to want all i had was a pocket edition of the heart of midlothian he accepted it thankfully crammed it into the pocket of his thick pea-jacket and off he went into the darkness with a broad grin of good fellowship lighting up his chubby face good luck and keep your peckers up i called over the side thank you sir you bet we will captain carry on in a flash the patrol boat was off and away and that's the last i saw of the british watchers at sea it wasn't much but it was comforting and cheering and the bright spirit of my friend the petty officer rounded it off with just the right touch we came to port in the bright dayshine with our cargo of pigs unravished and not a single shell in our cases of eggs so much as cracked so please remember our little ship good citizens at home as you sit over your breakfast and eggs and bacon that rasher you are now eating may for all you or i can tell have been in hamburg today but for the argumentative eloquence of our brave danish skipper and it may have emerged triumphant from the bathroom i sought so eagerly at the end of the stuffy corridor of the s s something that exciting morning you never know the spirit of rip van winkle is over the north sea there seems no doubt of that the german fleet is bottled up safe but savage behind heligoland and hiding like the great ugly coward it is in the armoured corridor of the keel canal only a few raiders are out and about swift sneaky ullens of the sea i hear of this on the misty raining morning of my arrival at leith dock i hear also from another food ship that has run the gauntlet like ours that a third steamer within hailing distance of our own crafty little vessel was blown sky high by mines yesterday afternoon my skipper who is standing by 
blows a whiff from his pipe and shrugs his massy shoulders ah says he puff puff then the mines are drifting puff puff with the swing of the tide in the fairway it is unpleasant other ships are following us if they have our luck i shall be surprised and the skipper was right eight ships running the gauntlet and immediately following mine were blown up in the supposed clear fairway i invite the captain to dinner in edinburgh we have a royal time but no schnapps for the absence of which i apologize and where next asks the dane poising a toothpick the size of a penholder another trip to esbjerg i shake my head i do not relish it esbjerg is a dull place and besides the probability of german mines making mincemeat of me for a menu of a shoal of north sea herrings is not altogether alluring france is aflame so on to france no more bacon ships thanks and to tell the truth this calm empty sea is getting on my nerves that concludes chapter four of first from the front and is also the end of section two section three of first from the front by harold ashton war correspondent of the daily news this librivox recording is in the public domain chapters five and six chapter five to paris rush scramble scurry the boat express jammed with soldiers and their kit folkestone packed with a flower garden of gay rich fugitives taking the air under crimson and blue sunshades at the harbour bayonets gleaming in the hot sunshine the steam siren of the channel packet screaming and at the gangway a charming lady whom i know her face grey and her voice urgent imploring Boulogne, says she for heaven's sake do not attempt to go there my husband has just returned with terrible tales the germans ah these terrible tales moonshine surely for when i get to boulogne in the evening glow all is quiet gay bathers are laughing and rollicking along the plage the little gendarmes with their absurd-looking red flannel trousers are lounging about with nothing apparently to do and at the station a pleasant official smiles and says a paris monsieur oui certainement le train is going almost at this moment en voiture monsieur these tales of alarm are just tales of alarm they mean nothing poof a pleasant journey monsieur a pleasant journey for the time perhaps yes the countess x and her husband are my fellow passengers we engage in a game of three-handed bridge we gamble riotously to pass the time for my pockets are a bulge with hundred franc notes to carry me through the siege of paris and i do not care siege forsooth the nearer we get to the gay city the more ridiculous this tale of investment becomes pray join us at dejeuner at maxim's to-morrow says the countess i shall be delighted the train stops with a sudden jerk 
as French trains always do. The gold-topped scent bottle of the Countess falls with a crash upon the floor. We are at some wayside station. The door swings open. Clamour, clamour, clamour upon the platform. A wild surge of people, civilians and soldiery. A French officer staggers into our carriage. His face is bloody and bandaged. Two of his fingernails are torn away. Upon his heels come others, fear stamped upon their faces. A young peasant woman with a tiny baby at her breast is the last to be squeezed into our compartment. I surrender my seat. Merci, monsieur. The baby stares, owl-eyed upon us all. Silently, the mother weeps. The countess gathers up the cards. We will continue our game at a time more opportune, says she. Dawn, at Gournay Station. Another battering, clamouring crowd of fugitives. Out of a tumble of grey cloud, the sun climbs, angry, with a bloated face. Not our own mild, sweet September sun of placid England, surely, but some bibulous, reckless relation, intemperately roaming heaven. England, the dear homeland, seems thousands of miles away. Is it conceivable that only a few hours ago I was in the quiet little garden in Maida Vale, in a deck chair, and dreaming over Dennis. I pinch myself, but the dream, if dream it be, remains. War is beating her wings all around me. I climb stiffly out of the carriage and mingle with the medley. Line upon line of troop trains crowd the junction. Horse boxes interminable each box labelled om quarante you eat chevaux you eat and scored in chalk upon the woodwork rough jests of war caricatures of the kaiser in all manner of ridiculous poses and ever the inscription a berlin a berlin soldiers and horses rammed in together amid the straw the men hot, sweating, dusty, but cheerful enough. These men and I are sworn brothers in next to no time. My arm is sore with the tremendous handshaking I have to go through. All my cigarettes have long since vanished. Slowly the troop trains move out of the junction, in a wreath of blue, caporal cigarette smoke. The French army smokes my good health. Bon voyage and a safe return. As it moves off to war, a Berlin. Six hours, at least, to wait at Gournay, whilst the soldiers are shoved through, to fling themselves, ardent and throbbing, around their beloved capital. This is not good enough for me, so I bow au revoir over the jewelled hand of the countess, her gold-topped cut glass and her diamond-studded bridge marker, and set off à Paris by another way, by road. A long detour southward, roads a stream with fugitives, the white dust rolling, rolling all quick progress barred no food no drink the bibulous sun now mad drunk fuming overhead all the world upside down and demented strange what little turns and twists our fancy takes in times of sore stress what was i thinking of in this dreary dusty plod city wards the wounds of war? 
a fair city trembling behind the thud of alien siege guns the bloody-faced french officer with the torn fingernails no i was working out in my mind again and again the play of that last bridge hand with the countess x in the paris train a battery of french artillery swung splendidly by in a fantastic whirl of dust a few short hours ago i should have been thrilled and stirred at the sight of it but now so speedily does one's mind and body merge into the prevailing atmosphere i moved out of the way of the grinding wheels half unconsciously ah i've got it at last if only i had finessed the knave of spades next evening still outside paris but northward this time and close to chantilly the famous racing headquarters of french sport a wayside inn the tavern of the cochon d'or everything quiet peaceful dreamy beautiful bonny hostess a meal for the very gods up in olympus delicious soup a rare omelette biftec actually patisserie melting in the mouth vin rouge coffee cognac tobacco madame asks is it true monsieur all this we hear of the war and the danger to paris the bombs of le boche myself replies true well there are tales madame i am beginning much to doubt them but anyway here you are safe madame assuredly monsieur nothing ever happens here rien rien ennui is our daily fare if you are going to paris and should be at any time near the rue de havre i have a brother monsieur a thousand thanks bonjour i turn down the lane the arrowhead on the signpost points to paris so many kilometres by moonrise i shall be there an easy pleasant journey why i wonder cannot they cook and serve in england such delicious meals as the one i am now digesting at the next crossroads the sudden clatter of many feet whips cracking voices shouting another cavalcade the strangest i have yet seen a pony chaise drawn by a perplexed thoroughbred three-year-old in it a man and a woman behind all manner of larette peanut loaded up still further behind a string of racehorses swaddled in their rungs and pack saddled with other household goods i stop the driver and ask him he is a square-faced yorkshireman what in the world is up up says he and his tired eyes seem to smoulder through the grime on his face up the devil's up and there's rage and terror and hell going on a few miles away a man of few words this yorkshire trainer but he crams a whole volume into them Ulan's raiding chantilly bridge blown up with a roar that set all the horses screaming and kicking drawing-room window smashed to smithereens stables raided out beyond the town two-year-olds collared for light cavalry work domed lot of good they'll be for that job aeroplane overhead marking the clear road yorkshire trainer and missus with their treasures wrapped up in a horse rug shove la princesse into the shafts of the chaise 
and do a quit double quick germans the raiding patrol scouting for a clear run to paris close behind mile further along the road a handful of english tommies hiding in the ditch with two or three machine guns screened behind the nettles and the keck hi says one brown-faced tommy to the trainer you english ay replies the yorkshireman and who are the blighters coming on behind french no germans by blank says tommy out of the way and let's have a smack at the somethings out you get sharp out they get sharp and in another minute they hear the withering cackle of the maxims like ten hundred thousand bloomin tin cans being rattled with pokers screams of torn horses cries of mutilated men and over all the triumphant paean of tommy give em hell boys give the blighters what for they get what for the blighters those who can turn tail and tear off others are floundering and writhing in the dust now turned into a horrible mess of red mud the torb aeroplane with a flick of its nasty fishtail soars away into the sunset the situation is saved that concludes chapter five of first from the front the section continues with chapter six an army marching to war paris at last not the old gay jubilant paris of my fond and frivolous memories but a city trying hard to smile and looking very dejected over it it is evening the gaiety of the boulevards is turned down to a mere glimmer streets beyond are dark houses shuttered lights out every shop closed and sad-faced concierges squatting on their doorstep i lose my way in these once familiar streets but presently find a friend who pilots me back to the boulevards by this time the night is black overhead pierced with millions upon millions of twinkling diamonds athwart the sky with measured rhythm the silver sword of the great searchlight on the eiffel tower flashes its blade high over the quiet city searching searching heaven for the roaming night hawks of the investing hosts of germany massed somewhere and nearer than most of the citizens dream beyond the city walls my friend quiet lazy fat and well filled with the good things of this world takes me by the arm come mon ami says he we will dine together on the meagre siege rations at the brasserie universelle there you shall tell me the news in paris we have no news no news of the war anyway we might as well be in birmingham or bedford you are a traveller arrived from the world of moving things you will be welcome at the brasserie i meet the same familiar crowd all babbling over the trifling boulevard news of the day they ask me as a voyager of war the news from the battlefields i tell them briefly for i am utterly weary the little tale of my yorkshire trainer the raiding ride of the uhlans down the white road beyond chantilly and the murdersome business of the english tommies in the ditch with their rattling machine guns chantilly murmurs my fat friend Puh, it's all a fairy tale you're telling us 
it's no good trying to pull our legs in that way they all laugh and won't believe a word and after all why worry the hors d'oeuvres in that snug little room upstairs are as good and as abundant as ever they were paris again next day and the next quieter than ever no bomb dropping aeroplanes no thudding of machine guns no uhlans dashing along the place de la opera no excitement no theatres nothing to drink after nine p m paris tucked up and asleep in bed at ten fancy that this is no place for me i am off again to look for war it is far more difficult to get out of paris than to get into it they are cutting down the trees in the bois de boulogne carrying them out beyond the barriers to screen the newly dug trenches the gates are sentinelled a yellow pass from the minister of war now in safe retreat in far away sunny bordeaux is luckily for me the open sesame to the locked and guarded portals a mile out i am stopped by the flicker of a too familiar bayonet so i must try another way how and by what means never mind i am away at last beyond the sentinels and the trenches screened with the drooping boughs of the bois tearing along the white smooth roads northwestward to the realms where excitement reigns peace still peace the summer sun flaming overhead the apples ripening in the long avenues cattle browsing in the fields peasants singing about their daily business no mutter of war not even a fish-tailed torb cruising amid the clouds the day advances the long white roads stream past presently i am in the cool green aisles of the outskirts of the forêt de cressy peacefuler and quieter than ever cock pheasants gorgeous in their early autumn plumage race along the roadside keeping pace with my automobile until with a half-human laugh they dart into the undergrowth we swing round into another glade by magic the scene is suddenly changed i run full tilt into the french army miles and miles of it moving along the forest road with never a sound beyond the rumble of the heavy wheels of the artillery and now and again the clink of scabbard upon stirrup iron you at home who read this may perhaps like to know what it is to see an army marching to war there is little thrill in it no visible excitement no clamour of bands no waving of banners no singing the men save their breath to cool their pugnacious porridge their eyes are not ablaze they do not hurry they just simply lope along at the easiest possible pace slack-shouldered smoking and uncannily silent but somehow there is a look in their eyes that is unfathomable what visions do they see ahead each man has his own but it is neither a vision of fear nor of regret nor of anything troublous you may be sure of that just a dream with a little flash now and then of the peaceable homestead left far behind the wife the sweetheart the child may be and at the back of it all the throb to be home again with this dreadful war over and done with 
the thunder clouds roll up the storm bursts down comes the rain torrent upon torrent of drenching thunder shower silently silently they grope through the rain these men of the western army the cavalry horses led in pairs with saddle and bridle stowed away in the rear to ease their burden until the call comes to dash into it are most dejected and downcast with the rain running in small rivers over their hocks their manes dripping and their skins ashine the guns are mackintoshed and swaddled as jealously as if they were tender young ladies braving a trip through april showers then comes the endless string of wagons packed with stores and food and ammunition motor vans lorries motor buses with the tops shaved off taxicabs ticking off fortunes of tuppences which will never be collected and anon a steam engine bearing the famous agricultural men of aveling and porter lugging along an astonishing circus of things this sudden glimpse of sanger in a wilderness of war makes me smile in spite of myself indeed the whole procession reminds me of a circus jogging along contentedly as i have seen it many a time from town to town between fair and fair tomorrow next week any time apparently would do for this strange conglomeration of mankind animals and machinery to get there yet everything is time to the minute festina lente hasten slowly is the signal motto of every moving army hasten slowly until you get to the fighting front and then that concludes chapter six of first from the front and is also the end of section three section four of first from the front by harold ashton war correspondent of the daily news this librivox recording is in the public domain chapters seven and eight chapter seven the piteous pilgrimage on the way to gournay a shining splendid morning with all the preliminary bustle of war around me i halt on the roadside back my car to the shade of a cool linden tree open my pack of stores and have a light agreeable luncheon sardines crisp crusty bread a slab of delicious brie cheese a stick of plasmon chocolate and a tin cup of blazing hot coffee from my companionable thermos flask a friend so often in need that never leaves me we sit by the roadside chauffeur and i the only civilians apparently in all this strange alluring world of soldiers 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 and guns and gear and horses and consider the situation we have maps of the road but no news of the war at all all we know is that in some wonderful way the huge terrible juggernaut of the prussian hordes has been checked at last in its terrific swoop upon paris that all around the city guardian troops are pouring in to quell the invader that miles upon miles of trenches are being flung up the two daring uhlans finding a way like sentimental tommy through the romantic glades of chantilly driven back and that the prussian gripped at last is grinding his teeth and fighting desperate and bloody rearguard actions amid the leafy roads leading down to the valley of the marne 
where to venture next i had not the slightest idea the french officer who presently rode up to ask my business he was excessively polite and nice was just as much in the dark as i what do you think i asked the captain shrugged and spread out his white hands monsieur said he the soldier is not allowed to think when he is at war he is a man no longer he is a machine just a little little cog in the wheel of affairs and he is quite content to be that he simply obeys he has no anxieties no trouble of any kind i have none the men you see marching and riding by along this dusty road have none so bonjour monsieur and a pleasant journey wherever you may be bound he salutes gravely and rides on i turn to my chauffeur well my friend and what is your idea of the situation max takes in a huge draught of caporal tobacco smoke blows it out through his nose monsieur says he the chauffeur who is engaged by his patron at two francs a kilometre is not paid to think he is a machine monsieur a little little cog in the great wheel i cannot help laughing at the dog well well so be it here is the map we will try the line on the north of paris gournay at any rate is accessible at a wayside station i said good-bye to max and near dawn next morning i was at gournay in a wonderful silver blaze of moonlight a night of amazing peacefulness and calm the train i was in was bound for beauvais but at gournay it was held up by a long string of belgian engines coming in from that sad and shattered country you can go no farther said the station master beauvais is impossible so we all got out there were not many of us and herded together on the platform with no idea where we were going next or how we were going to get there there were a few soldiers with us and the good citizens of gournay formed a circle around us bared their heads and sang with tremendous gusto the marseillaise next a halting verse of what i was able to recognize as god save the king and then a sudden silence Boom. 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 the guns were thudding northward over the mist which lay in this lovely normandy valley like a fairy shroud for three nights now friends and foes have been fighting in the moonshine i asked the station master where the noise of this battle came from he said crevacur there and at conti and at brecuil the extreme left of the allies was holding the line and had been holding it for several days at beauvais too desperate things were happening or were just about to happen i spent the night on a bench in the little station hotel the small boy who served my supper of most excellent chicken and red wine asked me wonderingly where i was going i said i wished to see the gallant french fighting at beauvais but how to get there not a train not a cab not a bicycle not a motor 
and the way nearly thirty miles not an auto said the lad brightly well monsieur i believe there is one an auto monsieur with four wheels even if only one cylinder out of three will work is a treasure now the soldiers come and borrow that treasure and redeem it later when the war is over at good interest the auto i tell you of is nearly broken in half but it can go like fury if i can only find jewels for you jewels and the auto are both in hiding but there is a way go to sleep monsieur and at seven in the morning mad jewels may be here bonsoir monsieur and to my astonishment at seven in the morning there was mad jewels at the door and the nearly broken in half car and all and two cans of spirit to feed it champagne the very finest dry champagne is cheaper than petrol hereabouts these days but it had to be done jules with whiskers sticking all out over his face like black pins in a pincushion drove like a sheer madman his name was appropriate enough we whirled along through the streaming sunshine over the white dusty roads at fifty miles an hour free enough and with all the way to ourselves for a time but swinging to the north we suddenly ran into bands of retreating pilgrims making their way to the coast they came along the self-same road which saw the retreat of the fugitives in eighteen seventy it was a striking picture they were nearly all women and children and boys boys too young to fight for their country a few old men bent and gnarled with the toil of a lifetime were with them here and there but the women were doing all the work of the cavalcades here came wagon after wagon some drawn by gentle uncomplaining bullocks and others by teams of four and sometimes six horses yoked by huge heavy chains the wagons were carpeted abundantly with straw and wheat wheat swept wholesale from the fields by the way on the straw lay and rolled and tossed the babies amidships forward the mothers wielded their heavy whips urging the sweating cattle on aft were stowed and stacked the household gods pots and pans clocks pitchers perambulators chairs cots chests of drawers everything and anything in fact crates of fowls were swung under some of the wagons very astonished looking birds most of them falling over one another as the vehicle lurched flapping their wings squawking and quarrelling among themselves strange it is how the long forgotten fancies come back to one at such times i was reminded by these bewildered birds of the nursery story absolutely forgotten since early childhood of henny penny and cocky locky mistress hen meets master cocky in a strutting adventure along the dusty road where are you going henny penny i am going to tell the king the sky is falling may i go with you henny penny oh yes cocky locky one old granny sat up prim and proper in her favourite chair which was lashed firmly amidships in one wagon she swayed a bit as the lumbering conveyance jolted along but she was fairly comfortable screening the sun from her long solemn face with a huge gingham umbrella across the valley 
the guns began to thud the old lady just jumped a little that's all she was getting used to this sort of thing anon there would be a halt by the roadside with the teams drawn up out of the way of the passing show and little parties of fugitives grouped under the trees and picnicking plenty of bread and cheese sweet normandy butter rolled coolly in a cabbage leaf red wine always red wine and perhaps now and again a new laid egg found in the straw at the bottom of the basket crate under the wagon and so this procession passed on in amazing motley nobody seemed to be actually scared though they could hear the growl of the distant artillery they were taking their time in their journey absolutely unaware that the germans were very near them they picnicked and bivouacked and slept on the roadside and now and then some of them sang i shall never forget the sight as long as i live that concludes chapter seven of first from the front the section continues with chapter eight beauvais the bold jules steered us by these patient sun-baked pilgrims with great care wagged his whiskers and waved his unoccupied hand cheerily to them as we sped we ran into beauvais at breakfast time as we entered the town at one end the french garrison which had been occupying it for the past ten days left it at the other the cavalry looking very smart and trim clattered gaily over the cobbled streets by the beautiful cathedral the artillery rumbled off gun after gun into the open country and by ten there was not a single soldier in the town the population wrung their hands and ran clamouring to the mayor asking what they were to do what was the meaning of this retreat the withdrawing of those invincible guns which had been hauled at so much cost of vigour to the green heights above the town overlooking the valley through which the germans were expected hourly nobody knew there was some significant meaning in it eh keep calm everybody cried his worship and issued a proclamation forthwith declaring that everything was all right that tranquillity existed and would exist and that business must be carried on as usual forthwith everybody bolted and barred his windows and then poured into the streets gallant brave beautiful beauvais in the turmoil of desperate things just as she was near six hundred years ago when charles the bold besieged her ungarrisoned as she was to-day with an army of eighty thousand burgundians in fourteen seventy two the citizens boldly closed their gates and maintained an obstinate resistance until succour arrived from paris the women then played chief part in the defence of their darling city they guarded the walls and shared all the perils of the men Jehan hatchet a fair fearless lass whose statue still stands in the market square appeared upon the breach at the moment of the fiercest assaults seized a burgundian standard which a soldier was endeavouring to plant on the walls and hurling the bearer to the bottom bore it off in triumph to the town this was on october the fourteenth fourteen seventy two and every year on the sunday nearest to that date a gay procession marches through the town to commemorate the event when i rode into the town 
with all its fit men away at the war the garrison fled and the raiding germans near at hand this thrilling history was within an ace of repeating itself the city was calm courageous drums were rolling at the street corners the women thronged the beauvais maids are fair and fearless still though centuries have passed and all listened heartened and cheered to the proclamation of the mayor bidding the citizens keep good courage open your shops your houses your cafes citizens all's well and as the little drum rattled its bold music eight regiments of cavalry rode away hard for crevecoeur and bretuil where the line was still being held i found that the railway through st omer on chaussee and onward to albacore was in the occupation of the french due west of formery the road was clear and the glad tidings came through that our left was fighting hard to fall back steadily on a plan long ago conceived to the banks of the wass that fine stand is now history it marked on our western wing the turning point of the war i do remember an apothecary before i leave beauvais i must tell you the story of monsieur x the little chemist who lives in the street of the golden moon there is an old proverb which reads the apothecary's mortar spoils the looter's music here is proof of it monsieur x does a lot of district doctoring in the pauses between rolling pills and dispensing draughts he is a rotund little man with a red plump face and a button nose upon the knob of which rests securely the bridge of a huge pair of spectacles behind the lenses a pair of childish blue eyes stare innocently but he is adept at his art his is a prosperous business and he has a motor-car he was out bravely enough on one of the days when the hosts of midian were prowling round and round the country and came suddenly upon an english soldier sitting at the roadside nursing a wounded foot you'd better look out governor said tommy after the good-natured little pharmacist had banged him up and hoisted him into his car there's a couple of em ulands about here so unless you want to lose your car op it matey op it the apothecary was somewhat puzzled at the phraseology of his newly found friend and patient but he understood the drift of it particularly as at that very moment they saw the raiders two of them riding easily through the trees down by the river scarcely a mile away so pharmacist and fighting man performed a judicious turning movement swiftly into the town told the tale there jammed a hood on to the car with a couple of men with rifles under it and hopped back again the plump little pharmacist driving slowly with sublime and splendid innocence with the afternoon sun flashing heliograph messages from the lenses of the large gold spectacles presently they came upon the ulans who held up the automobile with their usual fierce high and mightiness and declaring that they had lost their way demanded to be shown the direction or they spoke perfect french they leaned over the saddle-bows of their swift horses they produced their maps slung from their shoulders in neat leather cases with mica fronts which way had the french patrols gone surely they had been here or hereabouts yesterday 
the cavalry the guns the plucky pill roller without more ado suddenly dropped his steering wheel produced an antiquated weapon from behind his seat and blew a hole big enough to put your two fists through into one of the horses there followed a fierce but harmless volley from behind the tilt and a minute later two astonished and furious uhlans were riding together as prisoners on their one surviving charger toward the peaceful capital of the department of loise they were immured in a fine old stone mansion under the shadow of the cathedral and there remained on show until an ambulance lorry arrived in the city and carried them safely southward to paris between the two large coloured bottles in the chemist's window today stands a relic of that exciting afternoon a uhlan spiked helmet and underneath it written neatly in monsieur x's own hand a prescription label bearing the words a mort la boche as for monsieur x himself he was promised a prominent place in the great procession of october the fourteenth or thereabouts you may be sure he had it that concludes chapter eight of first from the front and is also the end of section four Section 5 of First from the Front by Harold Ashton, War Correspondent of the Daily News. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapters 9 and 10. Chapter 9 The Retreat of the Epicures. I have returned, by force of circumstances, to the gay city for a time anyway paris is bearing up most of the shops and very many of the houses are closed and shuttered the rich man has packed up his traps and with his manservants and maidservants his oxen and his asses the wife of his bosom and the children that are his has slipped away either southward whither the government has sped or to the more pacific watering places on the south coast of england the siege of paris is bound to come so i am assured by the babbling boulevarders whom i find still squatting in their favourite niches outside cafe and brasserie like cathedral saints more perhaps like gargoyles it will not be a starvation business like the historic investment of seventy it will be speedy and astonishing and no doubt disturbing the patriotic citizens who are staying to see it through declare with all their hearts and souls that if the germans do ride in under the mask of their great guns paris may surrender herself but she will do it street by street, inch by inch, and die gloriously in the doing. But I don't think it will really be anything like that. We shall see. Meanwhile, it is a dreadfully upsetting fact that you can't get a good dinner now at the Café Something, world famous for its choice of fare many parisians notorious in the city for the gods they make of their stomachs have been staying behind simply because there is no place in the world so completely so sumptuously satisfying as the cafe something the food yesterday was well suspicious today some of it was really bad the panic of the gourmands began it spread across the avenue de l'opera it clamoured across the broad boulevards 
and it died away in the booking hall of the gloomy station of saint lazare where many fat gentlemen with handbags were bidding good-bye to the gay city for ever with first-class single tickets for london we laughed at them as they waddled off there is still some comedy left in this gigantic drama if there were not it would be unbearable so we go back to the cafe after seeing our gloomy avised falstaffs away and proceed to drown their sorrows and float ours in foaming beakers of cafe au lait i am indeed sorry messieurs says the tall garçon as he bows before us but there is no more milk to-day even the cows are fighting for us if messieurs will be content with tinned milk the comedy carries on most engagingly and the second act opens with alphonse producing from under his apron a case of monsieur nestle which he brandishes triumphantly with one hand with the other he flourishes a sardine tin opener ah says he jabbing furiously at the tin if this were only the neck of wilhelm before the dinner knell rings out the balcony of this particular cafe fills up with a dirty bedraggled tired-eyed lot of men who like the armies beyond the city are resting for the weekend fleet street in paris here we all are again back from the tumultuous torrent of war from lille st quentin amiens beauvais from betuil and crevecoeur pontoise and compagne and other places on the map which are making fresh history here we all are hustled and harassed left wingers flung from pillar to post tossed from oulan to chasseur and back again no use for war correspondents in this war the army of the allies french and british alike but particularly british is rounding us up and heading us off with threats of imprisonment fines confiscation of kit and motor car some of us how impossible it all seems here in semi-careless paris have actually looked down flinching or not according to our kidney the cold steel of a rifle barrel others have been collared by uhlans and kicked ruthlessly out of the way we don't brag about it we have to grin and bear it not a man jack of us but has lost most of his luggage not a man with a whole sock to his foot or a clean collar to his neck that extraordinary thing called the journalistic instinct has brought us all back to paris for a brief spell and the chance of a bath and a shave the bath costs half a crown the shave two francs i have them both regardless i buy a new hat a trifle too friskily parisian for my fancy a new pair of boots and then as i wander lazily across the place de la concorde i suddenly remember the countess in the train the three-handed bridge gamble and the invitation to dine at maxim's so i cross the place and make my way to that palace of delights the blinds are down the shutters clamped across the windows the house is as grimly deserted and lone as the house of usher ah la pauvre comtesse that concludes chapter nine of first from the front the section continues with chapter ten 
the corporal of the foreign legion he swung into the cafe a fine tall young soldier stiff-shouldered erect his dark eyes afire jean he called beckoning the fat garçon who was slithering along with a tray full of apparitifs jean the usual monsieur replied the waiter but i do not know then suddenly the light of recognition dawned tion it is not possible but but it is monsieur a soldier wonderful the usual oui monsieur certainement it shall be produced instantly this was the cafe napolitan where the authors the journalists the poets alas tis a sad time for parisian rhymes and epigrams now foregather every evening each in his own seat reserved absolutely for him and him alone but the other day this new soldier was one of them a poet a dreamer an avid socialist the call had come swiftly for the honour and flag of france this young man with the fine eyes had dashed his dreams and his rhymes aside to button the blue coat across his swelling breast he has cut his silken hair the last sacrifice but he bears even that bravely he sits by my side in the cafe his breath is hot with battle though his limbs are sore with unaccustomed battering against the hard strong things of the bellicose world i am a raw hand says he a new boy not only raw-handed but raw-armed raw-legged raw-shouldered but i am settling down as a machine of war and it is magnificent i love it mon ami i love it great tales has this flame-eyed big eloquent boy to tell of the fighting around and about the forest of compain the splendid incidents of this furious business were the feats of the british cavalry general chetwode's brigade who did the most amazing things in a thunder and lightning hand-to-hand -hand encounter with the german cavalry twice the scots greys and the ninth lancers rode smack through their opponents in a dash of the daredevilry of which was superb they rode through them smashed their line and then turned and rode through them safe home again their casualties were few but the trademark they left upon the enemy will never be forgotten it demoralized them absolutely the british soldier says my friend carrying on his tail between great gulps of red wine for he has only half an hour to spare before he is back to the front is plunging along beautifully confident in his gallant heart that this swinging back towards the worse and towards the sane is all part of a very carefully worked out scheme tommy has his grumbles of course and the worst of all is the fact that he can't get any hot food to eat it is all cold tack and cold tack and the clamorous stomach of the british soldier do not exactly agree otherwise he is all right and still chanting with great vigour the tipperary song tommy has the utmost contempt for the german infantry's fire the germans can't shoot for nuts says he he doesn't fire from the shoulder like the english and french do but from the hip he never aims he never picks out his man 
but empties his cartridges clip after clip at wild and furious random again the french and english officers lead their men into battle with reckless bravery that accounts for the heavy casualties among them and two furious hours of this week's fighting has left a bigger mark upon them so it is said than the whole period of the boer war they don't care the heavier the trademark the more the glory the german officer's method of military stage management is altogether different from ours most of the time he is behind his men driving them forward as a drover drives his cattle but with infinitely more callousness and more cruelty his sword is in his right hand his revolver in his left and he is constantly using both already have i seen scores of german prisoners says my young socialist with an expressive shrug of his broad shoulders when they are captured they fall upon their knees they fling off their helmets they tear off their tunics they bare their breasts they grovel and then they toss their arms to heaven jabbering 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 all the time in a piteous frenzy it is a miserable sight they expect to be killed straight away they are amazed to find that no bullet no bayonet comes their way tommy says this tall young frenchman as he carries on his tail with a flash half of amusement wholly of love tommy goes into battle singing strange ribald songs which we cannot understand something about tip 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 tipperere he gets into trouble for this his officer tells him to save his breath for other things do not shout so demands he it makes you thirsty hoarse and thirsty and water is not plentiful just now tas a vous but and there was another smile from the light blue eye tommy says he cannot help it if he cannot shout and if he cannot sing he declares he will will what do you call it explode and when he is hit he does not cry and he does not twinge he just says blast and if the wound is a small one he gets the man next to him to tie a tourniquet around it and settles down to fighting once more and now cries my soldier friend patting his corporal's stripe lovingly and rounding off his refreshers with a big brandy and soda and now i must be away to be a soldier is more than magnificent it is sublime one has no cares and no worries one sinks one's individuality absolutely and becomes nothing but a cipher a number with nothing to do but to obey the order that comes whatever it may be i am number fifty nine i am no longer a complicated box of tricks that has to think to argue to ponder whether it may be wiser to do this or to do that i am told to go i go i am told to sleep i sleep flinging my already sore body for mon ami i am a very raw recruit upon the stony ground but when i go i go gladly when i sleep i sleep so soundly under the stars that sleep is a new and wonderful mystery to me ah to be a soldier my dear fellow is the most splendid rest cure in existence the certain panacea for neurasthenia so my friend 
au revoir i go back and with joy to my rest cures under the hot sun and under the gleaming stars he sprang up he saluted and turned and marched with a proud step out of the cafe well there's a little picture for you you boys at home you footballers you cricketers you philanderers who lounge about town buy your war editions regularly as they come out and then join other loungers at some favourite bar come out here you lads with health and strength and spirit come out and see or hear what tommy is doing how he is doing it and with what a merry heart he jumps into the yawning trenches his magnificent spirit would whip some responsive chord in you and spur you on to dreams of glory you couldn't help it in spite of yourself and if you cannot come out and fight if you are too flabby for that then stay at home but exchange your yard measure for the straight blue steel of the rifle stay at home and learn to guard your girl instead of making eyes at her if you do come out and fight and you're laid out early in the game with a splinter of a shell or the rip of a slim little steel bullet we'll look after you as we're looking after your brother now behind the firing line here is a snapshot one of many that still linger in my memory of a little scene on the coast far away from the battle of guns the scream of horses and the thundering of charge upon cavalry charge an ambulance van is wheeled gently onto the quay the quiet quick-handed men with the red cross blazing on their arms they are french doctors these lift the cool brown tilt of the vehicle and peep inside anglais says one and makes a brief note in his leather-bound book they lift tommy out lying straight and stiff on his stretcher like a dead man tommy scarred and battered with a strange beard sprouting all over his grey face but his eyes eager still though he can't sing any news of the scrappin says he are our beggars still hangin on we tell him what little we know it is reassuring and for these small mercies he is wonderfully thankful he smiles faintly the wagon tilt falls back into its place another huge bearded red cross officer with hands gentle as a woman's smooths our battered friend's sweating forehead doucement doucement he says and tenderly oh so tenderly tommy is carried over the gangway to the waiting ship the sea is quiet and still everything seems tuned to suit the needs of this wounded soldier being sent home again to england that concludes chapter ten of first from the front and is also the end of section five section six of first from the front by harold ashton war correspondent of the daily news this librivox recording is in the public domain chapters eleven and twelve chapter eleven the fettered city early on the morning of september the eighth a new order was issued from the minister of war changing all regulations regarding the passage of motor cars out of paris regulations nobbling war correspondents were getting more and more strict the automobile i had was allowed as far as the gates of paris thus far 
and no farther double and treble lines of sentries barred the way i drove through the bois de boulogne or rather by the outside edge of it the gates leading into the wood were closed it was full of sheep and cattle browsing on the grass these quiet beasts were being guarded by sentries with drawn bayonets more carefully perhaps than even the inhabitants themselves mutton and beef would for all we know be worth their weight in gold presently just outside the gates of the city the french engineers the trench diggers the foresters the gardeners from the bois assisted by a bustling army of willing helpers were working like niggers at the defences the peaceful bois had been ravished of its greenery to supply cover for the troops beyond the gates and the gates themselves were double guarded with heavy bulks of timber pierced shoulder high with little arrow slits for the convenience of the riflemen the ramparts were being strengthened here there and everywhere trenches were being dug across the way the seine from bank to bank was one wide huddle of gaily painted barges hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them they too like the bois were full to overflowing with food for a beleaguered city food for mankind and fodder for horses barges stacked with bales of hay and bags of oats more barges still were moving slowly along the fairway they carried another kind of food thousands of tins of petrol to feed the strings of automobiles taxicabs red cross vans and provision lorries which were being rushed out line upon line of them to the fighting front such a vast commissariat was indeed heartening it was hastening slowly like the army i have previously told you of to places beyond the city where it was most needed the army service corps were doing its work splendidly here was fuel for this vast engine of war fuel and to spare for many a long day on my way back to try another road out of the perplexing maze of paris i saw engineers with their magic gear at work among the girders and traceries of the eiffel tower they were slinging up quick-firing guns and clamping them down upon the balcony high overhead where in times of piping peace the parisian lingered over his coffee and his bock at the dizzy tower top the wireless was humming with the news of the war going on among the hills and valleys beyond the expectant city but the wizard lady of the air was no gossiper she was talking truly but with finger upon her lip i found that it was possible to get out of paris by train the germans had been flung back from their encroachment upon the further suburbs and hour after hour as they sped northward so mile after mile the railway line of l'ouest was reopened and trains were set running to the very edge of the war this was good news indeed every train as it left the city was packed with people some of them excursionists spurred by the spirit of adventure well fortified with luncheon baskets and bottles of wine touring out for the day for a breath of fresh air and a peep may be of the scarred roads and shattered houses which only a few hours before had marked the prussian rout rout for the time most certainly it was 
at noisy le sec a wide junction for the lines of the west i found train upon train of soldiers and horses moving out with no loss of time to the country though it was blazing hot the soldiers were all in good heart merry and jesting as they went to war the bulk of them were shoved off in horse boxes sitting among the straw with their red legs dangling over the line smoking the eternal cigarette singing chaffing eating the sweets that the girls they had left behind them had flung to them as a parting offer and all jolly as sand boys the horses stowed away behind them gazed out dreamily upon the unusual scene with their heads over the heads of the soldiers as these trains moved out others steamed in full of men wounded lightly in the fierce affray beyond lanye and among the wooded hills and dales in the historic hinterland of cressy in one of these trains i saw the first batch of german prisoners being brought to paris they were prussian officers six of them immured in a horse box and guarded strictly under fixed bayonets they looked woebegone scared and miserable they were bareheaded their faces were ashen grey three of them wore spectacles behind the glasses of which absolute terror blinked i really believe they expected to be shot in the next half hour or so they were taken out of their horse box and ushered into an outbuilding where they were placed behind an iron grill and left for a time on show admission to this temporary menagerie was a great privilege but all those who were allowed in made no demonstration of any kind against these pallid young men in their torn grey tunics with the shoulder straps wrenched away and every means of identification of their regiment destroyed they were neither groaned at hissed nor spat upon as had been the fate so we were told of french and english prisoners they were treated with the utmost deference as honourable prisoners of war that concludes chapter eleven of first from the front the section continues with chapter twelve the red general at war there was fighting in the forest of cressy so i set off next day to look for it this was hallowed ground where the black prince won his spurs and french and english fought not as brothers as they are fighting now but as deadly foes nearly six hundred years ago the grey goose quill sang through the green sward today the thirteen pounder was making very different music in my wanderings around the outskirts of the forest i came across as i have already told you three lost british soldiers wherever you go hereabouts you are bound to run into little parties of these strayed sheep never a one of them having the remotest idea of where he is his kit gone his regiment lost or scattered but himself a merry andrew of war a troubadour trusting to sheer luck to pull him through of such a kidney were my three the three manchesters utterly absolutely and most cheerfully lost apparently for ever i found them squatting on a tree trunk playing chuck hapney or rather chucks on team into an upturned german helmet they had been fighting hard for four weeks and their tails were rich and rare 
and most gloriously confused we've been paddin the oof for years and years and years and donkey's years said one of them our arts are all right but our oofs are as raw as stakes well i managed to find them a boat a sort of mixture of thames wherry and norfolk fishing punt and taking turn at the sculls we voyaged along the river with no more adventure than an occasional conflict with a dead horse safely to lanye it is a biggish town built half on one side of the river here twenty feet deep and half on the other and joined up by a massive steel bridge the town was now completely split in two by the hatchet of dynamite the british cavalry had ridden through the day before on a hot ulan chase they had left a handful of engineers behind to blow up the bridge if we can't go forward then we can't come back said they cheerfully enough up with the bridge boys good-bye they clattered off in a whirl of dust bang the bridge was shattered to smithereens and so were the roof the chimneys and windows of the hotel du pont de fer on one side of the river and the neat little millinery establishment of mademoiselle rene on the other the inhabitants crowding at a respectable distance on either bank looked on aghast five minutes later came through the order from headquarters it is not necessary to blow up bridge enemy well on the run hard lines for lanye but war is war and bridges do not count in such times besides the news was good news the enemy was on the run and bridges like breaches can be repaired i left lanye to take care of itself to join itself together at its leisure and further uneventful journeying brought me unchallenged and quite comfortably into the restful valley of the grand morin farther and farther eastward i rode until at last in the full blaze of noon i saw ahead the white dust whirling at the end of a ribbon of road and a string of london general buses ripping along stacked inside and out with yards of good wholesome french bread bales of cheeses quantities of cabbages and various other masses of comforting stuff dust and dirt and battle bruises had played havoc with most of these vehicles and daubs of brown paint slapped on anyhow had taken the shine out of them but i saw one of them with a number fifty eight still proudly flaunting overhead and greeted it as an old friend which had no doubt carried me in pre-mobilization days to my own door in maida vale its blushing glory had departed it was no longer the proud and shining red general its top hamper seats and all had been ripped off its windows had vanished and their place had been taken by sheets of that perforated zinc with which meat safes are covered there were no advertisements visible but the brass bell still remained over the driver's head and the string of it dangled behind the conductor had vanished with the advertisements the sensation was extraordinary surely it was a dream and i pinched myself hard the dream stayed 
more buses swung and jolted by and next a detachment of french cavalry riding with loose rein with the long tails of their splendid horses flicking a good-bye for the present message to the city far behind all speeding northeast where under a black sullen cloud trembling with heaven's artillery tumult of another kind raged we were not retreating this time somewhere beyond the cloud pierced now and again with livid streaks of flame the german right was rolling back a french officer of cuirassiers rode up spied my civilian garb and wanted to know my business there i pulled out from my grimy shirt a small library of passports permis de sejour and other vised documents and the officer laughed merrily and shook hands anglais said he ha ah, come along it's all right we have turned them we are at last chasing them this is our first stage to berlin off he rode like a whirlwind he was glad and jolly and so were the french tommies as they swung along burnt black as cinders their tongues hanging out their beards powdered with london and general omnibus company dust but their hearts aflame i learnt from these soldiers that since the day before the german right had been driven five and twenty miles up the valley of the marne and that it was still retreating and watching that significant cloud ahead one could see it plainly enough just beyond one of the picturesque little villages where they make the succulent brie cheeses when they're not fighting for the glory of france i ran across a little camp of ten nigger-faced british soldiers they were royal horse artillery boys all that remained of a hundred of them fifty horse artillery and fifty field artillery drivers whose job since they left southampton with five hundred battery horses was to supply remounts for the gunners the other ninety have vanished but the remaining ten under the fathering of a freckled mutton-fisted sergeant were cheery enough days and days ago they had lost all their kit they had got nothing except the clothes they stood up in and they hadn't seen a saddle since they left port in the bay of biscay where they landed their horses for weeks said the sergeant we've been riding barebacked with a couple of horses each to look after like a bloomin tournament show at olympia we've had a dickens of a time and no glory just bungin in spare battery horses when others have been shot hot work by gum blazin hot and not a weapon among the lot of us save our pocket knives and the rifles we pick up we're off to long champs to pick up some more ggs have you any idea of the road there we don't know where we are this might be timbuktu for all we know having seen the horse gunners or all that was left of them on their way to longchamp and taking the maida vale omnibus dust for a guide i moved on into the marne valley a combined rush of french and british cavalry had smashed into a patrol of german cavalry and had utterly demolished them on the outskirts of the small wood just beyond here a battery of our own royal horse artillery with half their men and half their horses gone did splendid work screened by a few forest trees they had cut down a hundred yards ahead a small stream flowed and beyond that the german artillery was posted 
a big thunderstorm was rolling up and in the gloom of it the artillery duel went on the french gunners were directed and the range found for them by a blériot aeroplane which circled round high overhead out of the range of rifle fire as soon as the range is once found these guns can go ahead with no further trouble for the recoil is worked on a buffer system and the wheels do not move an inch on the other hand the german field guns opposed to our crowd here were all fitted with the old spade contraption which necessitated continual relighting and much loss of time their shooting was good whenever they found the range but it was not a patch on ours and just as the thunderstorm burst we had them either smashed up or on the run absolutely demoralized in this fight the fight of the thunderstorm we captured a number of prisoners horse and foot they were tired and done and they admitted that they had not the stomach to face the charges of the british cavalry the storm which burst at the tail end of this fight in the marne valley was a sousing drencher both french and english soldiers stripped off their tunics and shirts and absolutely revelled in a glorious shower bath many of the men stood stark naked in the downpour a most amazing sight they looked black as niggers from the rim of their hats to the rim of their collars and the rest of them snow white in comparison this was the finest refresher they had had since the start of the war this and the glad the glorious news that the germans were retreating up the valley and following the snake-like meanderings of the placid marne but theirs was no meander it was a tumultuous retreat and our soldiers slamming on their clothes over their wet skins were after them in next to no time hot foot and all aglow i was told en route many tales of german brutality to the wounded by the lich gate of a little church in the village of st just a party of uhlans came across a belgian soldier with his left arm very nearly shot away he was lying exhausted by the roadside spent with pain and loss of blood instead of succouring him the german soldiers taunted him and then bayoneted him six times in the shoulders and the side then they rode off leaving him for dead but he managed to crawl along the road for a mile leaving a trail of blood behind him here he was found by half a dozen wandering soldiers who bandaged him up with strips from their own shirts and carried him to safety a draught of red wine pulled him round and to-day he is still alive to tell the tale i believe that these plucky tough little belgians can stand anything they are not men of flesh and blood they are amazing stalwarts of steel that concludes chapter twelve of first from the front and is also the end of section six section seven of first from the front by harold ashton war correspondent of the daily news this librivox recording is in the public domain chapters thirteen and fourteen chapter thirteen the beckoning hand miles and miles and miles of desolation wherever one moves in this war-swept valley of the marne only a few days ago so peaceful and so beautiful one meets with the same piteous sight 
nature like niobe all tears wringing her hands at the mad and merciless deeds of her children the country here is very like my own native valley of the ooze in huntingdonshire the sky is a serene blue flecked with fleeces of tender white cloud in the water meadows the cattle all that is left of them still stand knee-deep in the lush grass the evening breeze still makes music in the willows which bend over the stream with their silver leaves tinkling but all the birds have vanished gone heaven knows where out of this shattering tumult under the serene blue of a summer sky an uncanny silence reigns the world is holding her breath shocked terrified the writhing flame has sped over this sweet country leaving it seared and scorched the slow waters of the marne are no longer blue with heaven's soft reflection on a summer day but livid and dreadfully malodorous with the swollen bodies of dead horses hundreds and hundreds of them ay and of men too in a quiet bend of the river where the water runs clear in the shallows the tall reeds lean over and in the morning breeze seem to whisper affrightedly one to another in the shadow of them half buried in the mud and ooze a dead horse lies saddled and bridled with a gaping jagged wound in its throat it is a cavalry horse horse and rider are still here comrades in death as they were only yesterday brothers in life dashing full tilt to death or glory on the wings of the morning the stirrup leather is stretched out tight the foot of the rider is still in it jammed hard and fast a slim small elegant little foot high booted carefully laced deeper still in the water as the sun strikes upon it i can recognise the smart uniform of the chasseur the gentleman rider of the guard i have neither the heart nor the pen to tell of these ghastly scenes a blind man could follow the track of this battle storm easily enough and i have floundered along it until i am sick the fire is still smouldering over the shallow graves of the dead the brave dead entombed so hurriedly that one sees here and there in these gruesome cemeteries a brown hand thrust through the shovelled earth as if beckoning the hump of a shoulder tunic and shoulder strap torn away it is dreadful think of it if you can for over a hundred miles behind the battle line these burying grounds mark the scenes of carnage that concludes chapter thirteen of first from the front the section continues with chapter fourteen a human document one warm thirsty afternoon found me wandering aimlessly along the empty dusty high street of the small village of cressy on bree most of the houses here as in other villages round about were shuttered and desolate the street was littered with rubbish half-starved woebegone cats lay in the sun sleeping in pitiable attitude of dejection presently an english tommy a hefty curly-headed chap with his forage cap stuck jauntily on the back of his head came along out of an alleyway 
carrying a French baby on his broad shoulder, talking British nonsense to the wide-eyed brat. Hello, said he, you're British. Glory, hallelujah. Come to the Green Dragon. That's the English for the bloomin' pub down the street. The only place in this godforsaken hole where you can get a tiddly, and that nothing but rum, but not so bad. He piloted me to the Dragon Ver, and there, squatting on a bench in the little sanded bar parlour, we found six other khaki fighting men of the fourth ammunition column, third section, Royal Field Artillery. They had a camp of spare battery horses out amid the trees at the other end of the village. They had wandered aimlessly across the country from the coast with what they called their spare parts. Rotten business, said my friend, when he had set the baby down at the Green Dragon's hospitable door and told it to toddle home. Rotten business, all graft and no glory. No fighting, I asked. Lord, yes, any amount. Or as blazers too. But we had a damn sight too much to do in looking after our horses to be able to enjoy the scrap and properly. Our attention was took off the business. Our string of thoroughbreds, thoroughbreds, I don't think, took colic and took it bad. And what with looking out of their stomachs, poor beggars, and writing up my diary, which I'd promised the missus faithful I'd do, I've had no time for anything else, so to speak. He unbuttoned the flap of the breast pocket in his tunic and pulled out a penny washing book. If you'd like to cast your optic through it, sir, you're welcome. I not only cast my optic through it, I found it a document so human that I craved Driver Thatcher's permission to copy it out. There ain't time, sir. There's stacks and stacks of it. God knows the time it took me to write it all out. But I'll read it to you, if you like, so as you can get the hang of it. I've got to go and water the horses in half an hour. So he read it out, word for word, with all the pride of authorship shining in his honest, smudgy face. Here it is. I would not alter a line or word of it for worlds. It tells, with sublime nonchalance, of the worries and troubles of Driver Thatcher, Royal Field Artillery, during that tantalising time when his string of spare parts took the colic. That was all he cared about. Hell was thundering about his ears, shells were screaming, death riding riot. Driver Thatcher brushes all that away with impatience. How to stop that damned colic? That's the thing that matters. Troops moving toward France. Well, we started off from Hendon to end train at Park Royal and we got to Southampton about two o'clock next morning. Got horses on board all right, though the friskiest of them kicked a lot. Got to Havre safe. Good passage and quick. My little lot camped in a village outside the tan. Nice little house, us four had, but the back premises was rather stinky. They mostly are in this country. Food, good. Rabbit and potatoes and plenty of beer. Not our English sort, but the colour of cider. Us four enjoyed ourselves with the family and had a good time and left ten o'clock next day well filled up. 
our objective was a place called Compain on the ooze we marched off from ham somme about seven o'clock on the twenty fifth left three dead horses lying on the road we got through all right what ran our horses on the way from pumps and taps at private houses the people were awful kind giving us quantities of pears and filling our water bottles with beer that was all right our welcome was splendid everywhere the people in the asses came out and cheered and gave us plain chocolate fruit and beer and several other items at compain we got into touch with the germans very hot work all our guns in action all round and the people of the villages flocking in a panic towards paris it made us feel downhearted what we saw here we marched from compain about eleven o'clock on the thirtieth which was sunday our way was through a pretty little village where the people tore down the heavy laden branches of the damson trees and sent us off munching the fruit and very cheerful the way was hard terrible steep hills which knocked our older and weaker horses colic broke out among em too and that was bad we lost a good many and had to leave em dead or dying alongside of the road we got within six hours of paris when the germans surprised us and drove us back we scooted quick and dodged em in the dark until one o'clock in the morning when we lay on the roadside men and horses together fagged out slept until five a m and then marched on again still retreating what a zell it was nothing to eat or drink plenty of tea but nothing to boil it with at last we got some dry biscuits and some tins of marmalade bill thompson whose teeth were bad went near mad with toothache after the jam but toothache is better than starvation anyway we marched through Rallentier and pierre ponds the author notes at this point though mr thatcher is very careful to note down names and dates it is not to be wondered at that he occasionally makes little slips due more perhaps to ignorance of the puzzling french language than anything else Rallentier, which he mentions here is of course no town at all signposts bearing that word are to be met with along most of the main roads Rallentier is a warning to motorists that there is danger ahead it means literally go slow end of author's note food on the way apples and water now we make our way through the woods towards the ferry no dead horses thank god to-day i hope we have checked that expletive colic but my horse fell into a ditch going through the wood and could not get out for over an hour i couldn't go for help because the germans had got the range of the place and their shells were ripping overhead like blazers poor old dick the horse he was that fagged out by the long march at last i got him out and went on and by luck managed to pick up my pals the woods were twenty-three miles long we thought we should never get out they seemed everlasting it was night and moonshine when we at last got to satinus satuan we are all stony broke ever had no money since we left southampton which seems years and years at four a m next morning we got to rary and right into the middle of it with our tired horses and us tireder still nothing to eat and dry as bones 
the germans were lambing in at us with their artillery and poor old dick got blowed up i thank god i wasn't on him just then our theorses of l battery royal artillery got smashed and we had to bung in our poor old tired ones to fill up only a few gunners were left but they stood by firing on still and singing onwards christian soldiers then the germans charged and our gunners did a bunk but not before they had drove spikes into the guns so as to make em useless to the enemy they said they guessed they would get em back in a day or two and if they did they could repair em easy enough the germans don't know these tricks and we can do em dan any time september the first the battle still going on very fierce the author notes no more is said about the fight for colic among the horses has again broken out and our gallant driver is much more troubled about that and the job he has in stopping it than the actual fighting end of author's note september the second more fightin and worser than ever i don't believe we shall ever get to paris now we come to montagny and fightin all the time rabbits and apples to eat galore but still no money and no good if we add because we can't spend it we've got nothin to smoke so we are not half happy i don't think we have also captured a lot of german horses mostly officers charges which have galloped into our lines i suppose as the officers are corpses i stopped one and found a yellow packet of french cigars in one of the saddle bags it wasn't half all right i tell you september the third we progressed this day four miles in twelve hours took the wrong road and had to crawl about the woods on our stomachs like snakes to dodge the german snipers we had one rifle between four of us and took it in turns to have goes we shot one blighter and took another prisoner they was both half starved and covered with sores then the rifle jammed and we had nothing to defend ourselves with at last we found the main body again they wanted more horses and we were just bringing em up and putting em to the guns when a german aeroplane come over us and flew round pretty low the troops tried to fetch him down and some bullets went through the wings but then he got too high we were still letting go at him from the low trees where we was laying when we suddenly found out his game he got up higher and dropped a bomb in the middle of us but it exploded very weak and nobody was hurt next day we started on a night march and got to lagney thorogny and camped outside the tan where the people fed us on rabbits again i said i was sick of rabbits and me and bill thompson walked across to the farmhouse and borrowed three chickens which we cooked it was fine they wasn't tough as you might expect cause bill knowed the dodge if you kill a chicken and cook it straight away before it is cold it is as tender as anything bill knows a lot of dodgers like that and he is a useful chap to be with on the march at lagney thorogny we heard good news and found that the guns of the l battery had been taken back from the germans by the thirty-second brigade royal field artillery outside lagney there was more fierce fighting twenty miles of it and the germans were shot down like birds we got in another rock corner 
and managed to get at just in time after mending the old battery guns which had been spiked by our chaps two minutes afore the germans collared em we had just left our camp and some wagons there when the german shells fell into it and blew it all to bits september the third continued firing is still going on but it is not so fierce though scouts have come in and told us there are ten thousand germans round us this day tonight i got two ounces of navy cut it was prime september the fourth we marched from camp at five thirty p m and kept on marching until three in the morning september the eighth we are marching on further away from paris we shall never get there i guess and no more will the germans if me and bill knows anything september the eleventh marching to cressy passing hundreds of bodies lying about like rotten sheep we are behind the main army now but can hear the guns going september the twelfth in the village of cressy plenty of food and asses to sleep into here we've got to stay until further orders colic still very bad but the rum at the public house very good i hope it will last our time here for the time i will leave driver thatcher of the royal field artillery and bill thompson that crafty borrower of chickens and the rest of these careless wanderers of war who love their horses beyond all things and do not care a jot for screaming shell and battering shrapnel so long as their spare parts are snug and safe and well out of the way of the racket we shake hands on the well-worn doorstep of the green dragon mr thatcher carefully buttons the flap of his pocket over his precious washing-book cheer o says he that concludes chapter fourteen of first from the front and is also the end of section seven section eight of first from the front by harold ashton war correspondent of the daily news this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapters 15 and 16. Chapter 15 The Battle of the Walking Wood. The way along which I set out for the forest of Cressy was trampled flat by the passage of hastening soldiery. Here had the artillery thundered by leaving hoof-marks by the hundred and thousand, and horses dead and dying in all manner of horrible attitudes. There is scant time for mercy toward these poor dumb beasts. The sight of the wounded ones strikes a pang into my heart. They lie there by the roadside, under the flaming, pitiless eye of the sun, their necks stretched out, their nostrils bloody one poor thing raises its head as i pass and the look in its sad sad eyes haunts me in my sleep still for mercy's sake it seems to say put me out of my misery the road was scored deep by the wheels of the heavy guns the flotsam and jetsam of war lay thick around a peasant showed the way to the forest and when at last i struck it lo it was a forest no longer but an amazing scatterment of tree trunks ah the beautiful forest said my guide it is beautiful no longer its music is mute the birds will no longer sing in its groves 
the forest of Cressy has been guillotined. The ravished trees stood there stiff and stark, decapitated, and still, one could almost imagine, bleeding at the neck. What had happened was this. A few days back, the French and English, in overwhelming numbers, had poured in from Lagny in the great ensemble toward the Marne to reinforce the flanking skirmishers that were already going on. Ahead were the Germans, in ever-increasing hordes, stiffening their battalions, bringing up their guns, rallying their cavalry for a forlorn hope to carry the Marne and to hurl themselves into Paris. To turn this we were, luckily enough, in time. One of the smaller woods to the southeast of Cressy was already held by the enemy, but although the wood was cover for a time for them, it also was confusion most confounding. In the night our patrols, greatly daring, smelt them out and carried back news of their whereabouts to the cavalry on one side and the infantry on the other. Incautiously enough, the Germans were moving about the Bois with stable lanterns to guide them, unaware that trouble was so near. And that did for them. Suddenly they found their twinkling glowworms a mark for a foe of whose proximity they were blissfully unaware. They were smitten woefully, hip and thigh. A midnight hailstorm from our maxims suddenly screamed through the sleeping trees. The rifle fire, too, was excellent. Our men don't blaze away at random at an invisible target nowadays. Next morning, scores of lanterns were picked up in the wood with their glasses shattered and their reservoirs pierced. A yelling, hallooing cavalry charge finally cleared this tragic little wood. Our losses were slight, but the Germans suffered severely. Twenty of the prisoners who had been taken in this melee were herded together in a clearing. Their rifles were not taken away from them, but stacked nearby. In a rash moment, they got the idea into their heads that they were but loosely guarded. They made a combined rush for their rifles. They will never make another. Now, back to the forest of Cressy for a moment. When I saw it on the day of my visit, and found what had happened and heard the story afresh, told with many a twang of rich Lancashire humour from the lips of three lost British soldiers whom I met there, the book of my memory opened at the tragedy of Macbeth, and I read again, and with a peculiar relish, the moving act of Dunsinane. The day before, I was scuttling along in a sort of tearing nightmare in the wake of Maida Vale motor buses, Pickford's light horse, tooting along with Tucker for our fighters, shedding their supplies, and easing up behind the firing line what time the Royal Army Medical Corps were converting them with extraordinary speed and completeness into swift and comfortable ambulance vans for the wounded, to carry them back behind the lines out of harm's way. Up above, among the wreathing clouds, our blerios and our steadier nestors of the air, the biplanes, were hawking heaven and telling our gunners by quick, sure signals where to plant their shells. This was the new strategy, marking the plunging moments of Armageddon. A few hours pass. A curtain of thunderstorm is drawn black and menacing over the scene. 
the aeroplanes have vanished the motor buses have swung off westward with the wounded and we are flung back across the centuries to schemes and scenes of medieval warfare the forest of cressy is the wood of burnham maybe from the tower of some still standing chateau a modern macbeth looks out with startled eyes from under his black helmet to see the trees of cressy walking this is how it was done done in the morning mist which shrouded trenches and trees and made dim spectres of the flitting soldiery french and british alike swarms of them set about the wood with axes and knives and saws and even sabres and had a wide area of it down in next to no time line after line of infantry each man armed with a thickly foliaged branch moved forward in close order towards the enemy whilst behind amid the lopped tree trunks our artillery fixed themselves with their machine guns and the very business-like thirteen pounders to cover the wood as it moved forward all a rustle the attack which followed rapid fierce and as bold as anything that had been done in this huge campaign won all the success it merited it came off trumps the mysterious slow-moving wood soon showed that there was more than umbrage in the texture of it it snarled flame and spat bullets whilst overhead the shells of the french and british artillery sped screaming to their mark but one incident nearly upset the whole show just under the ridge of a hill to the right of the forest large quantities of our own ammunition were piled ready for sudden service and apparently well screened and out of harm's way the oncoming french cavalry making a detour for purposes of their own struck the hill and rode along it for some distance for a few minutes and a few minutes only they showed themselves on the skyline in the bright sunshine there was no mistaking the vivid scarlet of the breeches stripe against the green background and the flash of the white long-tailed stallions they are so fond of riding and they were spotted at once by the german artillery the kaiser's batteries the pick of the bunch were here lost no time in finding the range presently the shells began to drop thick and fast over the ridge falling so near to our precious ammunition as to make the situation remarkably unpleasant but the british soldier was up to that as he is up to everything in this campaign little parties of our boys swarmed up the hill stripped to the waist and set about lugging the great heavy boxes out of the way of disaster and explosion my soldiers three they are manchester men were in this and they tell me that it was the hottest the flamingest corner they ever had been in they came through it unscathed so did our ammunition but it was more by good luck than anything else by evening the enemy had been repulsed the marne was clear of them and the fight was rolling farther and farther away east of the french capital that concludes chapter fifteen of first from the front the section continues with chapter sixteen the sack of son lys the cry of the chase is alluring fascinating irresistible hounds full pelt after the prussian fox scent breast high and a dazzling morning of sunshine to hunt in out of paris on the early dawn 
a straggler perhaps in the chase but not so very far behind the road is long and straight through a mighty avenue of tall trees here and there hailstorms of shrapnel have torn the branches to tatters and leaves lie thick along the road there are graves too by the roadside marking the shock at various vantage points of yesterday's tumult these graves are common objects of the countryside no more to be remarked than molehills here and there where the highway forks to the right or left there is a pile of turf four or five feet high and strengthened by hastily hewn logs of wood and behind it a sort of prehistoric dwelling roughly thatched and with just a rabbit hole for a doorway out of this hermitage a sentry leaps waving his long thin bayonet your business monsieur i show my pass the soldier shakes hands and off i go again under the tall trees in the tallest of which i have time to observe out of the corner of my eye a snug little nest three battle roosters perched high in the umbrage their red legs dangling from the bough their bayonets blinking in the sunlight and then for a full hour there is no sign of war anywhere but perfect peace miles of apple trees along the roadside laden with fruit ripening rosily in the sun a sweet little stream trickling along merrily women at work in the fields singing a milkmaid sitting at her business under the lee of a lazy red cow a pretty farmhouse in the background with a cock gaily plumaged strutting in the yard and lording it over the obedient hens indeed all the delightful rural ingredients for the house that jack built then swiftly a swing in the road a dip downward the flash of a tall white chateau mirrored in the lake under the trees a rustic bridge spanning the stream and suddenly we are among the outskirts of a town there is an acrid smell of burning in the air an old peasant woman her apron loaded with bread meets us and we ask what town is this it is no town at all messieurs she replies drearily though yesterday it was it is a ruin the ruin of son lys the germans <laughs> she spits upon the ground the germans were here until yesterday here for three days burning pillaging ravishing rioting then in the afternoon there was an alarm a wild fight in the smoking streets and they fled with their craven tails between their legs a wonderful fight sirs go into the town and you will hear more of it the town smelt like a twitch fire on an autumn evening it was an amazing terrifying ruin every house but one in the two main streets the Felborg st martin and the rue de la republique was burnt out every roof tumbled in the windows gaping and black and still smoking coarse jests scribbled in chalk on the scorched walls with caricatures coarser still to illustrate them litter of broken bottles crockery ware furniture shattered pitchers cradles clocks ironmongery bolsters bedsteads clothing burnt and blood-stained litter indescribable the one house in the principal street to remain untouched 
was the hotel du grand cerf the leading hotel of the town why it escaped was because the german officers chose it as their headquarters during their stay the hotel was still open i entered in the wide hall i met the landlady a tall handsome woman with black hair and eyes and a tongue eloquent of the tragedy she had just passed through have you anything to eat i asked for i was hungry nothing monsieur but six small tins of sardines and three bottles of champagne the sardines were left behind by the germans the champagne is all that remains of nearly two thousand bottles in our cellars i hid six bottles under the counter there was bread and there was butter too and a trifle of gruyere cheese the simple meal was spread in the large deserted dining hall and the landlady as she attended upon my dejeuner told me her tale three days ago said she the german soldiers rode into sonlis soldiers they wore uniforms of grey and spiked black helmets and carried guns but they were not soldiers they were roisterers bacchanals monsieur half of them i declare were already drunk two officers went to the chateau of the mayor dragged him out and declared that as they entered the town a young man had fired upon them there was only one penalty for that the mayor was brought out and placed against the wall of his house together with two of our principal citizens monsieur simond and monsieur barbert and the three of them brave unflinching noble the three of them were shot dead i witnessed it monsieur from this very window by which you are sitting there is the wall you can see it by just turning your head those splashes on the plaster those bruises are the marks made by the bullets the officer in charge of the firing party called to some of the citizens standing trembling by he pointed to the corpses of the mayor and monsieur simon and monsieur barbert he spurned them with his boot take this offal away and bury it said he and it was done the landlady opened another tin of sardines placed them on the table and went on with her story then followed other things the prussian officers and some of their men marched to the cathedral and from it they brought all the candles all the tapers they could find then they formed a regiment of the inhabitants now march said they along the streets of the town open all the windows and doors of your houses this they did wondering what it might mean and now said their cruel masters turn again and march again this time to the fields beyond the town bring hay from the haystacks bring ripe corn from the cornfields each an armful as much as you can carry this again they did and coming back into the town they were commanded to pile the hay and the corn within their houses this was done with great care so that not a house in the main street of sonlis was missed the citizens were marched along in military order behind them marched the germans with the candles and the tapers from the cathedral now lighted they marched along with candle in one hand and a bottle of champagne my champagne monsieur in the other 
and as the hay and the corn were distributed into the houses they tossed the flaming candles one by one into the open windows until presently the town our beloved town was a hell of furious flame there is still some coffee left monsieur but alas no cognac i will make the coffee and then you shall hear the rest of the story the officers and many of the demons who were with them billeted themselves upon me in this hotel they wrote their names in the visitors book here it is i have kept it as a relic of their raid they made me get out all my best sheets prepare the rooms boil gallons of water for hot baths and serve the best meals at my command they raided the cellars below and brought in from them eighteen hundred and twenty bottles of champagne they ate and they drank they made beasts of themselves one of the officers surprised my little daughter on the stairway you are too young he said but i desire a memento of this pleasant visit what hangs upon the little silver chain you are wearing at your throat it was a medallion of the virgin the prussian tore it away from the shrinking child and fastened it round his own gross throat this he said and he spoke french well enough as did many of them will be a memory to me of Sonlis, Sonlis and a pretty maid in the afternoon of the thursday which was yesterday the tables were turned a whirlwind of soldiers came into the town avenging angels the little zouaves dashed in in taxicabs hundreds and hundreds of them three in the cab and one on the roof they dashed in and drove the germans out it was a fierce fight and bloody but soon over beyond the town there was carnage in a farm scarcely a mile away two hundred and fifty germans are lying dead in the next village there are two hundred more alive and prisoners in another form guarded only by two wounded french soldiers and three english five to two hundred monsieur but the five are brave men the two hundred are pigs drunken pigs that concludes chapter sixteen of first from the front and is also the end of section eight section nine of first from the front by harold ashton war correspondent of the daily news this librivox recording is in the public domain chapters seventeen and eighteen chapter seventeen the luncheon hour from my diary sunday paris scene the cafe something avenue de la opera many of the epicures have returned with tremendous bravery to the scenes of their past triumphs paris serenely smiling welcomes them back and spreads her treasures and her truffles at their feet garçon the hors d'oeuvres the waiter brings up a wide flat tray divided off into twelve compartments and flanked by a huge jar of pate in the compartments are every kind of choice titbits anchovies sardines herrings potato salad crevettes etc etc crisp warm rolls fresh sweet normandy butter snowy napery tall sparkling glasses 
clatter of knives and forks popping of corks sizzle of siphons flow and gurgle of wine red and white monsieur's plate is piled with pate de foie gras his napkin is tucked under his chin his eyes shine he settles down to it these shrimps are excellent ma foi excellent just a few a dozen or so ah and now for lunch but the man who misses the hors d'oeuvre at the cafe something is a fool mon ami he does not know what is good for his soul in shattered son lease monday on the wide steps of the beautiful cathedral the town shattered and still smoking an acrid smell taints the atmosphere the sun streams down hot and blazing upon the little gathering of the general staff of the french army they are seated around upturned empty cases of motor essence in drawing-room chairs rescued from the loot of the mayor's beautiful chalet white tablecloths are spread over the motor essence cases there are napkins too folded carefully into the semblance of a bishop's mitre a young lieutenant marches up the cathedral steps his arms are loaded with provender a yard of bread three bottles of rhine wine which the german officers left behind in their sudden flight from the town they are now lying dead and still unburied in a horrible farmhouse four miles away four tins of sardines and a slab of gruyere cheese wrapped up in an old copy of la guerre sociale his arms and hands thus burdened he cannot salute the general but clicks his spurred heels together and bows stiffly you will join us in our dejeuner lieutenant blank merci mon general blank but i have already lunched he gazes hungrily upon the meagre though tempting fare as he deposits it upon the tablecloth salutes and marches down again into the gloomy town as the dejeuner proceeds in stately ceremony women and girls pale wide-eyed and wondering and all dressed in black from head to heel mount the steps pass trembling by the bright uniforms and steal through the great west door of the lonely fane to pray for the souls of their dead forest of compagne tuesday the french column is marching through the glades absolutely noiselessly except for the complaining creak of the big wheels of the ammunition wagons the zouaves well nigh two thousand of them are swinging along in fours at the head of the column as we move northward under the whispering trees i talk to one of their officers a tall slim young man with the dark dreamy eyes of a poet eyes which seem to be gazing far far away and a voice soft and musical there says he pointing to the head of the line are marching the two hundred heroes of the red taxicabs when son lys was still burning and the enemy were dancing like gnomes in the red light my zouaves in the little crimson autos whirled gaily into the town surprised the ravishers slaughtered many of them and drove the rest into the woods they caught the colonel sleeping in the chateau of monsieur simond whom he had shot and chased him naked except for his shirt through the park he hid in a drain but they found him the story stops here 
from the head of the column comes the sharp word halt it travels down the line as far as my lieutenant halt says he in almost a whisper of that girlish voice of his and the next moment the zouaves have stacked their rifles eased their pilgrim packs and are sprawling on the soft grass by the roadside in twos and threes they crawl off into the woods wriggling into the undergrowth like snakes half human cries are heard amid the shadows and presently out into the glade again come the brown-faced wire-bearded little warriors each with a pheasant in his grip the plucking and the roasting are soon done the smell of the rich brown flesh is very sweet red wine from the water bottles washes the feast down a cigarette a snooze and then attention and the quick word to march the column closes in and swings on again over the red fez dances the plume of a cock pheasant's tail feather we are not satisfied with breaking nature's laws in this great game of war we must break the game laws as well the village of ponchard wednesday not a house stands even the village gardens have been swept empty by the passing hurricane an old old woman one of the few left from the fury because she was too old staggers and gropes half blindly along the rubbish scattered street we offer her money and a kindly word she flings the money down and stamps upon it with her clogged feet money she screams what can i do with money in this empty wilderness for the love of god give me bread i am starving play up arsenal thursday the railway siding at noisy la sec thomas atkins of the royal field artillery ammunition column sitting happily on a truss of hay remounts in the background nibbling the same thomas fights his tin of bully beef with a blunt sardine opener he digs out a lump and hands it to me on the end of the blade very filling but dry i produce my thermos out comes the cork with a pop the coffee made at dawn steams hot and aromatic what says tommy coffee oh coffee sounds too good to be true thanks i don't mind if i do and now sir have you such a thing as an english newspaper about you we've had no news of anything anywhere for years and years i produce a crumpled copy of the daily news and hand it to him he turns the sheets hurriedly war 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 columns and columns of war little or nothing else so he hands the paper back sadly i wanted to see what the arsenal is doing says the soldier where's the sporting page shot away in the war i reply well i'm blowed says tommy what a war it is to be sure that concludes chapter seventeen of first from the front the section continues with chapter eighteen how we brought the glad news we are going forward said the french cavalry officer to drive the germans out of campaign a pleasant sunday evening's amusement monsieur whatever the sunday evening's amusement promised this particular sunday afternoon was certainly pleasant 
the forest of Compain was bathed in sunshine the white road through it northward to the town was thickly carpeted with dust as the column moved along its progress was absolutely silent the wheels of the ammunition wagons might have been rubber tired for all the noise they made the rumble of the motor buses stored with supplies seventy-eight of them i counted in one string was muted and the pad 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 of the infantry as they marched along behind was so soft as to give one the impression that they were wearing carpet slippers there was no haste no flurry there never is in these quiet deliberate chess moves of the army off to business it was all timed to the hour to the minute when luncheon time came later than usual because a damaged bridge a couple of miles behind us had delayed the cutlets and the camembert we picnicked lazily enough under the shade of the trees merry as bean feasters and afterwards wandering about off the main track came across some of the trenches of the prussian snipers and a dead ulan lying in a gully head down and heels up just as if he had dived in and stuck there over him stood a signpost bearing the legend forest of compain shooting rights strictly preserved we hoisted our kit on our shoulders again and moved on the turcos marching easily in fours and each carrying about a hundredweight of kit of every conceivable kind were spoiling for a fight and ready for anything and the joyful news that there was business for them ahead set them softly chanting weird and blood-curdling battle music as they swung through the forest several hundreds of them had already come off victorious so one of their officers told me in a wild dash on the unsuspecting germans through the forest of ermenonville it was a taxicab fight and the turcos were whirled into it in scores of the familiar red taxis commandeered from paris we had not proceeded far in the forest when the column i was accompanying received a sudden order to halt there had been a swift change of plans and an order to turn westward once more what did this mean the french army stood still in the dust along a mile and a half of curving road and scratched its head evidently said my friendly captain the enemy has had news of our coming and has either fled or is fleeing from compain by this time our orders are clear to march westward and to leave the town alone the prussians have been in possession of the place for three weeks now the good lord alone knows what they have done there i'll go and see said i it will be interesting admitted the officer i wish you a pleasant trip it will also be exciting the snipers he laughed significantly i said i would set off immediately if i could time was precious and it was necessary to get back to paris before night there is nothing to prevent you monsieur pardon me said i but indeed there is across the way there you see the signpost pointing to compain between the signpost and myself there stands a very considerable portion of the third division of the army of france a thousand apologies monsieur it shall be moved immediately and moved immediately it was opened out shoved forward 
and squeezed back at the very point where the long arrow head on the signpost pointed a campaign so that i could pilot my car through run to the beleaguered town and dash back to paris in time for dinner it was charming of my friendly captain he hadn't the slightest idea who i was except that i was english a friend and a brother but cheerfully and with great address he upset the army for me and as i swung by trying desperately hard to keep a grave face two thousand soldiers of france saluted me to the man the turcos grinned the direct forest road to compain speedily proved too hot to be pleasant a bullet sang over my head struck a tree at the side of the road and ricocheted high with a wail to it like the complaint of a seabird tossing in the wind another and another bad wild shooting but best to be out of it anyway so we took a wide detour leaving the sneaking little trenches of the prussian snipers far behind in the village of ponchard the most dreadfully desolate place i have ever seen with every house burnt out and even the pigsties smashed dead dogs lying swollen and ghastly in the roadway and graves of soldiers in the kitchen gardens there could be no mistaking these little mounds with here and there a rough wooden cross over them we all but collided with piled wreckage of a previous collision two heavy motor vans lay here overturned with their wheels sticking up in the air do the motor lorries engage in single combat in this amazing war evidently for here was proof of the encounter one was a square german van painted slate coloured every inch of it the other was british whisked over to france no doubt in too much of a hurry to allow time to transform it it was bright crimson still and on the side of it i read in letters of gold the alluring legend croydon creamery company and underneath this a notice in smaller lettering calling public attention to the fact that the croydon creamery company possesses a reputation unrivalled for its cakes its icing and its confectionery here too by the strangest of strange chance i met mr geoffrey young my colleague of the daily news polite and urbane as he always is and ready to assist anybody in distress mr young was on his knees in the back garden of a ruined house raking among the cinders for some small treasure a poor widow had lost the old lady was on her knees too by the side of my friend the two made a picture to be remembered i assure you alas the treasure was never found we joined forces and drove together to compain on the outskirts of the town we met people running the germans they told us had left only two hours ago in hot haste blowing up the bridge over the wass as they left in the town the streets were a swarm with the population mostly women dressed in deep black we drove into the square where stands the famous statue of la pucelle the people swarmed round us the old men shouting and waving their hats the women crying with the joy of their relief we were english we were embraced and made much of hugged kissed and danced round 
oh what news messieurs what news how goes the war we are dying for news they cried for many days we have been the slaves the serfs of the germans we have fed them and housed them we have given them the best of everything true they have not ravished our town our beautiful chateau still stands as it did and there has been no burning but they have taken all our wine every cellar has been rifled every cigarette has been taken every ounce of chocolate we have had to make them sweetmeat until all the sugar has been exhausted we have had to wait upon them hand and foot it has been terrible we thought we should have to be their servants onward for always until two hours ago then suddenly and most speedily they left us they crossed the river in great haste and were gone we could scarcely believe our eyes as they vanished this must mean good news does it messieurs does it we assured them that it did we told them of the general retreat and they were so glad that they sang songs of triumph in the market square around the listening statue of the maid of orleans and as the beams of the westering sun fell kindly upon her warlike face the maid seemed to smile homeward by another route we ran once more into the wake of the whirlwind into the valley and over the hill of death the beautiful country was strewn with the most ghastly relics of the fray up one hill i ran into all that remained of a german battery an awful heap of dead men and dead dismembered and disembowelled horses baskets packed with live shells british cavalry of the second division of our first army had dashed in among them from behind the screen of trees a biscuit throw away and had cut most of them literally to ribbons at this very moment in the cabbage field beyond a squad of peasants were digging their graves toppling them in like so many turnips in a pit and shoveling the slack earth over them a little further along more dead horses lay by the score peasants were covering them with rice straw pouring oil on them and setting fire to them the smell of roasting flesh was abominable and coming as i did suddenly upon it i was violently sick but in time i became salted to this terrible business indeed dead men and dead horses became as common as ordinary roadside objects here and there among them actually among them a tired out french soldier lay asleep as peacefully and as dreamlessly as though he were at home in his own bed it was hard to tell until you actually touch them the living from the dead further on still towards torcy a bridge over the canal had been blown up another burning of our boats five and thirty blue blouse frenchmen were working desperately at the wreckage so as to patch it up in time for the reinforcements the hounds and the huntsmen which were already hurrying up they were staggering along the road carrying on their shoulders scaffold poles trunks of trees hastily stripped of their garniture balks of timber and roughly hewn broad planks help us messieurs they cried so my chauffeur and i stripped our coats off and sweated gladly with the others we flung this post-haste bridge into some sort of holding shape 
but very tottery just as a fleet of automobiles dashed along the narrow road with artillery officers on board behind them came a dust bespattered ammunition column dozens of huge motor buses packed with munitions of war vehicles of rubber neck excursion parties some of them and still splashed with advertisements of trips from paris we got them across the bridge somehow but the very last of the lumbering rear guard smashed up our hasty patchwork and it all had to be done over again that concludes chapter eighteen of first from the front and is also the end of section nine section ten of first from the front by harold ashton war correspondent of the daily news this librivox recording is in the public domain chapters nineteen and twenty chapter nineteen an army corps of sextons from my diary every evening now the mists steal up earlier the nights are longer and the great moon which served as a lantern for the furious night battles has now dwindled to no more than a flicker in the sky the nights are longer in the woods beyond sonlis the better for us say the peasants and the better for the dead if it gives us more time for our work of burying so they march out these old men hump-shouldered roomy-eyed with their shovels their picks and their mattocks on their shoulders to do the bidding of their new masters who promise them good food and good pay if they only do their business speedily and cleanly they are a new corps of the french army the corps of the sextons and there is no age limit to their term of service when they enrol when the curtain of night has fallen they go out from the villages and the farmsteads an uncanny silent procession to set about their business among the shattered dead their way is illumined by horn lanterns and torches their shadows dance ghoul-like in the flicker of the beams little old men most of them and bent double but their shadows amid the trees are the shadows of giants the willow wand crosses their women follow behind bearing little bundles of peeled willow wands and strands of wire they cut a few inches from each wand and bind it on crosswise with the wire and whenever an officer is found cold and stiff amid the huddle of the dead a cross of willow wand is planted over his grave hour after hour night after night the corps of the sextons with their women cross-bearers ply their harrowing trade weary and wan marking cemetery after cemetery their bundles of sticks diminish as this acreage of the dead swells it is not god's acre it is the devil's the dismal night glooms on the tallow candles in the horn lanterns flicker feebly flicker and go out the dawn stalks up out of the east not softly as the september dawn should arrive to set the fairies dancing back across the glades to their daytime hiding places not softly but with a jagged frown wrinkling heaven's brow and the thud of guns far away marking the passage of the morning hours then come the piled rain clouds careering overhead at the command of a relentless southwest wind 
heaven above is sobbing sobbing now she is pouring her tears in drenching streams over the graves the shallow trenches packed with dead men become quagmires and down every little hill the water streams and bubbles it is brown water tinged with streaks of red blood and tears in champagne country the shock of battle has not passed here but devastation and pillage have left their sordid trademark the vines have been mowed down to make way for the relentless armies millions of bunches of rich grapes lie smashed and bleeding everywhere the wine towns have been raided cellars stormed and rich vintages looted by the prussian hordes mad with thirst here and there are signs of fierce revelry of wild drunkenness here no doubt among this astonishing litter of broken bottles is to be found the secret of blazing towns and villages of desecrated churches of ravished women the german soldier sober and at war is a terrifying force to reckon with the german soldier drunk and at war commits deeds unnameable the tales the women have told me in this region told me with a frankness that you at home would not believe to be possible have made me shudder though i have just come through scenes of death and horror more than enough to sear the soul of any man and the tales are true enough an hour among these piteous martyrs in black listening to their torrent flow of narrative stamps them with certain truth of that i am as sure as i am that there is still a sun to shine above this scarred dismantled desolate region of france la belle france back in paris after thirteen nightmare days i pass once more by the sentinels through the gates of paris as the sun goes down and the flashing eye of the searchlight on the eiffel tower begins again her roving commission amid the clouds i find calm in the city and a reassuring flicker here and there of the old gay spirit there are jests in the newspapers hey the parisian journalist who skipped like a scared rabbit with a ferret at his tail a few weeks back has now returned to the scenes of his past triumphs he wears a clean collar and a new butterfly bow he finds his old table at the cafe calls for a bock and pens ink and paper mademoiselle butterfly is out again her high heels click saucily along the wide pavement of her beloved boulevard there is a fresh streak of crimson on her lip cupid has bent his bow once more in london again back to town is no longer a world's end journey but a matter of a few hours i find the club just as it was most of the old faces a hearty welcome the same old stodgy food and just the same placid philosopher chewing the end of his big cigar hello back says he yes i reply back for a change of clothes and a breath of fresh air and then off again to-morrow morning well says he there's just time for a rubber of bridge between the battles will you make one folkestone harbour monday i have been writing up my diary in the train i meet a friend at the gangway and as he is going back to town 
i tear the pages out and ask him to drop in at fleet street if he has time what will this new week bring forth i wonder i am out roving again the wanderlust of war is uncontrollable when once the fever is caught that concludes chapter nineteen of first from the front the section continues with chapter twenty the whirlwind crash upon crash of thunder blue lightning leaping with vicious spurts out of masses of violent cloud drowning rain in torrents hissing down blinding drenching and cutting the skin like knives mud thick and binding ankle deep knee deep axle deep every road a quag and every lane a morass and a new army the army of the west marching into it for the honour and glory of france fresh men fresh horses fresh guns the men eager the horses well fed and fit the guns crouching and ready for the snarl under their careful covering of canvas and tarpaulin thus on sunday september the twentieth began this memorable week and the fiftieth day of the war could any but fiends fight in such an elemental upheaval it seemed incredible the floods were out small streams which were little more than a trickle a few days back were now roaring torrents the ain was hurtling along foam-flecked fury of a river carrying its livid cargo of corpses to the sea the thunder as the clouds whirled overhead did not growl or grumble it was thunder gone mad every shot of it exploded with a frightful clang right overhead at the tail of the leaping flashes of blue flame and under this deafening olympic tumult the game of war was still being played swiftly craftily every move full of momentous things by some strange luck i was in the very middle of it i had worked no problem out there was no time for that but some sort of eerie instinct had carried me along and dropped me amazed and frightened i tell you truly i was frightened at the immensity of it all into the very heart of the movement of the western army already the prussian hordes were sullenly savagely retreating step by step and fighting like wolves every inch of the way along the extreme left of the allies line in the roaring storm or series of storms for there seemed to be no end to them or to their fury a mighty plan was laid hatched and fledged in a few short hours from the east the army of lorraine or most of it was hurried round southward reinforced heavily on the way and rushed on to the western line to bring off that great coup desired by all generals in all wars an enveloping movement this or most of it was accomplished under the concealing curtain of thunderclouds with the vivid lightning as a torch to show the way and the hissing rain to screen the army's march and it would have been over and done with long before this had not the enemy conceived the self-same plan and hurried their men and their guns their supplies their aeroplanes their cooks and bottle washers across the whirlwind from the left of their line to the right the brain which moves the prussian juggernaut is quick and keen and crafty it does not miss much it was a race in the rain 
who would get there first little news of the exciting scramble could be obtained by either side for in such a drench of weather no aeroplanes could live for five minutes so it all resolved itself into a pretty puzzle blind man's buff of war the german right wing flung itself into the difficult country northwest of noyon slapping its mud encumbered legions into the quarries with which this rugged terrain abounds planting its guns over the ridges commanding river and railway entrenching in the scattered woods and sending its flying squadrons with their lightweight cavalrymen on their lissom horses scudding through the villages and darting among the trees careless of capture and doing the most daring of things behind were the massed troops some of the flower of the german army grinding grinding along in numbers seemingly incredible they are still playing the steamroller game these fair-head teutons lashed on to death and glory their eyes turned southward with the iron cross their guiding star and their courage amazing as it ever was they are fighting splendidly there is no doubt if there are huns and pillagers and ravishers among them there are also fine soldiers brilliant generalship and courage unbounded courage is now matched with courage generalship with generalship and the balance is swinging now on one side and now on the other the roaring of guns is still throbbing in my head as i write this a prisoner of war immured in a machinery shop with a gendarme smiling complacently at me as he sits on the hard smooth table of a steam lathe swinging his red legs i will tell more of my adventures in this curious position later but now as far as i am able and to what extent i am permitted i will deal with the fighting and what i saw and heard of it before the fortunes of war swooped down upon me and led me manacled and blindfold out of the tumult in the early hours of this exciting week i found myself a shivering victim of a million scorpions of rain at a somewhere amid all the moving incidents of an army on the march a muddy drenched army tis true with the infantry slogging along hump-shouldered and blinking in the drench like a vast horde of drowned rats and here too to my infinite surprise was general someone the politest the most gentlemanly the kindest soldier one could ever wish to meet here was he with his staff around him his kind quick eyes taking in every detail of men and horses guns and gear food and hospital equipment and all the rest of it and never missing a scrap the way in which the men greeted him as he swished by in his huge mud-splashed motor showed how much he is loved is worshipped how he came here from afar and why some magic a magic as mobile as those thrilling carpet journeys in the arabian nights may perhaps account for it from where he lay waiting patiently in the faraway area of the battle line the call came to other territory a swift urgent call and so he is here and we will say no more about it except that you may be sure he was wanted pretty urgently in the great business afoot the general cast his eye upon the damp moving multitude of blue and red and nodded as they passed his smile was encouraging 
his words few but sweet and satisfying to the soldiers as they faced the tearing rain and splashed onward heaven might frown upon them and batter them with her fierce tempests what mattered this to them so long as their general smiled somewhere behind those growling clouds the star of france was shining in this manner then the army of the west lolloped along in an easy half circle to the aisne still being battered by the rain thunderstorm after thunderstorm growling and howling over them stopping with cruel persistency where they stopped moving when they moved still pouring its vials upon them the chasseurs are paid on their light little bicycles wooden rimmed and tired with red rubber rode on ahead to see that the way was clear for in these torrents no aerial scouting was possible the way was clear fairly clear at all events until amid the scattered woodlands in the region of the foray de Ix, blank the bicyclette chasseurs came upon a number of german scouts at the same game rode them down through sheer hard peddling and collared half of them too breathless to fight some miles to the west of the woods in the small town of Ix, blank situated conveniently on the banks of a flooded tributary of the wass the general staff established their new headquarters a very large factory was commandeered and here the agile brain of the western army having silenced the whirl of wheels settled down to the big problem before it by tuesday morning the rain cleared a blustering southwester sprang up the sun came out again in summer splendour the long level roads dried up with extraordinary quickness and life was worth living again even to the tired bedraggled soldier at Eix blank we unshrouded our precious aeroplanes spread their yellow wings and made the snuggest of snug camps for them in a delightful clearing in the most fairy-like scenery it was ever my joy to see fifteen kilometres away the prussian eagles though we were unaware of it at the moment were also drying their wings and preening their feathers five or six miles to the west the heavy boom of our own guns came clearly to our ears boom for boom the german artillery replied somewhat fainter because farther away minute after minute the cannonading went on kilometre by kilometre our advancing army strolled along still at the same jog step in the wide factory yard french soldiers stripped to the waist cleaned up the grimy cars of our general and his staff and polished up all the brasswork spick and span the general lunched on freshly caught pheasant in spite of the fact that he is a thorough sportsman and that it was not yet october and sped off through the little town to make closer acquaintance with the thunder we could hear growling on ahead and then up into the dazzling blue went the aeroplanes until their waspish hum was no longer audible and their wings no bigger to the eyes than the wings of dragonflies we were ourselves again our men were dry our horses dry and our eagles dry and hastening up into the eye of the sun a couple of minutes later over to the northward where the white smoke of the big guns rolled up over the hill hung for a moment poised in the still air like balloons and then filmed away into nothingness 
a couple of minutes later a torb aeroplane darted toward us like a swallow on the wing our own little blerio spotting the danger whirled upward in swift circles until it was high over the torb then it swooped downward again the torb swerved banking dizzily and i heard high in the air an exchange of shots with no more noise in them than the sound of a crystal palace rocket discharging its golden stars on a summer's night the torb turned and fled our bird chased it hard until hawk and quarry disappeared from view it was a thrilling picture this aerial duel very pretty too the loveliness of the morning was supreme ours for the fairies to dance in but death was screaming and writhing only a mile or two away we were already taking it as a matter of course death is our daily business just now we are fighting day after day from sunrise to moon time we fell asleep beside our red-hot guns they come and drag us out of the way by our feet as though we were dead men they take our places wait a while for the night mist to cool the hot steel and then get on with it again shattering dream time to hades that concludes chapter twenty of first from the front and is also the end of section ten section eleven of first from the front by harold ashton war correspondent of the daily news this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one around lassini how many days this hot battle of the west had been waging i have only a hazy idea on sunday and monday both armies were entrenched in morass and quag and finding cover as best they could both from the shrapnel of the guns and the shrapnel of the skies in the neighbourhood of lassini a village on the high road between Mondidier and noyon the fiercest struggle raged lassini is or was until the demon of war came along and made it hideous a delightful little place in the heart of the cider country it lies in a dip and hills command it to the north and the south during the wild weekend weather of september the nineteenth twentieth and twenty first the germans came and nested there building themselves in snugly against the weather they found great quantities of cider and cheese which the scared population had left behind and they had a rare time feeling fairly safe under the cover of their guns on the northern hill the inhabitants had fled panic-stricken with what goods and chattels they could carry with them southward behind the guardian lines of the french army other villages all around were also cleared and held either by the french or the germans but lassini for some reason or other which i cannot understand seemed to be the place most cherished and most desired in the night the french suddenly opened a withering fire on the place and racing down the hill under cover of the screaming shells took the enemy by surprise the teutons had been gorging and drinking heavily tankard upon tankard of cider litre upon litre of red wine that red wine the prussian cherishes with a love surpassing the love of woman many of them were drunk few fit for fighting in the dark and in the rain and all chary of the long slim french bayonet la rosalie it is called 
which has done such deadly work in this war there was hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the village street fierce and terrible but not for long the germans were tumbled back heels overhead to their own hill and glad enough they were to find shelter there once more next morning the tables were turned the german guns swept the wood and blighted the little village a cavalry charge tore down the hill and the french were routed in the evening there was another charge from the south more bloody business with la rosalie another occupation by the french and so this ding-dong business went on with the sportive spirits of the contending armies on either hill betting on the result of the next tussle the village was a shambles the street was piled with dead and dying and when i tell you that in two days eight hundred french wounded were brought out of the place for treatment in the field hospitals and elsewhere that prisoners were taken and retaken wholesale hour by hour on both sides as the bloody battle hammered grimly on in sunshine and in starlight rain and thunderclap you may have some idea of the carnage in this place how the fighting was kept in the wild weather hour after hour day after day is astonishing amazing there is a limit to human endurance but endurance in this war seems superhuman they were hardly men that were fighting here they were mudlarks apparitions most woeful to behold the contest on this line between the village and the next was closer and more hand-to-hand -hand than it has been anywhere in the whole range of operations the troops were near enough to shout taunts and sarcasms to one another during the lulls of cannon practice mud everywhere was so thick and binding that it was well nigh impossible to get the heavy munitions of war along or to make mobile use of the artillery but the cyclists on both sides slipped out between the showers and the rapier play of the lightning and had sharp encounters among themselves and one of the french officers a light cavalryman whose deeds of horsemanship are well known and remembered at olympia told me that when he was scouting he had witnessed several man-to-man -man bouts with bayonet and sword and clubbed rifle which reminded him of incidents in the iliad one french infantryman who had lost his kit and his company was plugging along in the dreary weather in search of his comrades when he came upon a young german soldier similarly lost but very much better equipped he was sitting on a fallen log by the roadside this young german eating a full meal from his bulging knapsack a beautiful brand new knapsack of red cowhide the frenchman coveted this knapsack above all things so he rushed for the german and bowled him over in the mud they fought on the ground with fists these two literally a tooth and nail encounter in the end the frenchman won and claimed the german as his prisoner but let him go on the condition of the rich ransom of his cowhide kit and its contents in the knapsack in addition to the ordinary necessaries of a soldier were many strange things some of which very much surprised the simple french tommy into whose hands this precious loot had fallen they included a brand new set of safety shaving appliances a small silver-rimmed mirror a scent spray a manicure set 
and a natty little pocket brush and comb the frenchman though simple was polite as all french soldiers he bowed to his beaten enemy mademoiselle said he i must apologize for my treatment of you i was not aware that i was fighting a lady in the skirmishing among the hills around the courts their court air court connectel court and elm court the french light cavalry put in some very pretty work the german raiding horsemen were no good against these reckless slim young devil-may-cares whenever they saw them coming they turned and fled and in the scampering race which followed the frenchman generally won and came prancing proudly back to headquarters behind lassini each with a prisoner and a horse in hand as the clouds were clearing and some hope of better weather dawned the french rode full tilt into one end of ellencourt as the germans fled from it at the other end leaving behind them a whole colony of wounded progress was now distinct and gratifying the left of the allies were slamming along and the enemy were backing sullenly and slowly and fighting with slogging vigour every inch of the way for many hours the germans held the useful little line of railway running eastward toward noyon what railway stock they had managed to bag they made the best possible use of but from a hill to the south the french artillery had got the range well marked in their retreat the germans packed long lines of trucks with stores guns and men and began the exciting game of running the gauntlet in order to hurry their troops back amid the rough country of the quarries where a staunch stand had been planned they managed to get two or three trains away before the other side tumbled to their game then the shells began to fall plug 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 along the line one engine was smashed and its complement broken up before this reckless attempt at speedy transport was abandoned slowly steadily the battle mass moved eastward good indeed for us but bitter gruel for the germans who in spite of reinforcements of great strength were shoved back by main force in the stone quarries north of Atiki, they found for a time safe harbourage in natural fortresses which they protected as best they could from rain by doors torn from houses and farm barns in the surrounding villages hundreds of doors were used in this manner they were converted into roofs thatched with turf and heather and the leaves of forest undergrowth and under them the german infantry crouched and let fly at anything and everything quarry for quarry along came the hounding army of the west intent on the same strategy stowed away their guns amid the crevasses and the jagged precipices on the hillside facing the enemy and there at close range greek and trojan blazed away at one another with the object more of demoralization than death hammer hammer roar roar they went at it the wildest blasting these dumb and stricken quarries had ever had which side would wear the other down first that was the problem who could stand this demoniac clamour of incessant gunfire the longest weary and worn with bloodshot eyes tattered garments and senses numbed beyond the natural understanding of things these men humans no longer but mere machines 
working grimly on at the bidding of the master hand moving behind all this tumult kept on in a gloomy nightmare playing the incredible game of war as it has to be played in these tearing terrible days there was not so much death in this clanging torrent of shell-fire as demoralization noise and fury was the object of both sides time and again men crawled out of the trenches shaken out of all semblance of humanity they were gibbering lunatics some of them like falstaff on his deathbed babbling a green fields deaf as adders a wild terrible look in their eyes their hands trembling their feet dragging as they walked like the feet of men paralyzed their faces grey their hair bleached and the wounded the wounded who could not walk crawled to as near safety as they could get crawled groaning screaming cursing leaving little smears of blood behind them i have many a time seen a shot rabbit creeping home to its warren with a shattered leg dragging behind it creeping creeping and squealing so these men crept and squealed until the bearers came along and eased them of their agony processions of the dead moved southward all day long often as not two men carrying one by the heels and the shoulders others were borne out of the line upon hurdles and doors and now and again a priest with head bent and finger marking the passage in the close breviary he had just been reading would head the procession ah these village priests these men of god in the firing line what dreadful things they have seen what horrors have moved before their quiet eyes what poignant ministrations have been their lot how splendidly they have done their duty day and night they labour for the wounded for the dying for the dead they seem to be moving and living in a dream there is a puzzled look in their eyes the world is upside down is god still in his heaven all along the germans have been boasting of the demoralizing effect of their gunfire they have been building upon it but one by one their castles are toppling about their ears they find that the frenchman fighting for the glory of his country possesses a spirit that is unquenchable a heart so high that it cannot be hammered into submission by all the sound and fury that ever came out of the steel cradle of krupp and so up to the end of this wild whirling week all was going well with the gallant western army there was still great clamour and smashing and roaring amid the quarries still hand-to-hand -hand fighting through the desolate village streets with their doorless houses staring amazed at the tumult that raged by their inhabitants fled long since and the very cattle and fowls gone passing through these places i have been saddened to tears though god knows i have seen enough of horrors in these last few nightmare weeks to make the heart of any man a heart of stone to dry the fountain of his eyes for ever desolation is so absolute the flaming armies have passed through like a whirlwind smoke and ashes remain to tell the tale every clock in public and private places has stopped at various hours of the day or night time is standing still holding her breath 
but now that the sun is shining again and the clouds have gone brighter hopes rise fresh with every dawning day general something as he rides out of his commandeered factory every morning to see how the battle goes carries with him an air of high confidence his strong smiling face gives great heart to the troops as he swings by in his great car another week of the war is beginning and for us it is beginning well as i turn from the tumult and ride away out of it all in a few hours i am back again in twilight time at beauvais it is a wonderful evening of red sunset slowly the glow dies away lights twinkle in the town the little stars come out one by one and from the tall ghostly tower of the grand old cathedral the evening bell rings out softly sweetly in this calm twilight of grey gothic things End of section 11section 12 of first from the front by harold ashton war correspondent of the daily news this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 22 and l'envoi chapter 22 a prisoner of war the great enveloping movement of the western army the swing of the door with the shell-torn village of Lassini for the hinge of it, seemed likely to go on interminably. When I left the area of operations toward the end of the week, Lassini had already been taken and retaken about a dozen times, in daytime and in night-time, under the scream of shell, the drench of shrapnel, at the point of the bayonet the hinge was clogged and stiffened with blood both armies were shoving like mad at the door in their attempts to slam it here indeed was the tail end of the biggest battle that has ever been fought in the world's history von kluck was crowing no longer but he was still digging his sharp claws in among the quarries refusing to budge though the dead piled around him crest high beauvais calm afforded time for reflection only the faintest echo of the tremendous conflict reached this quiet town my colleague and i if it is not safer it is more companionable to travel in pairs in these thrilling times held a long consultation de guerre as we sat in the sweet morning sunshine on the steps of beauvais cathedral mapped out our plans and set forth through the slumberous old city to search for an automobile to carry us back to the battle zone it was heart-breaking business we walked miles over the hard cobbles and at last found the only auto left in the place it belonged to the local undertaker and it was hidden away behind a great gloomy hearse curtained with all manner of purple trappings of woe this was not exactly a cheerful beginning it was ominous to say the least of it but we got it and we got it with the gallantest driver who ever opened throttle a handsome spaniard maurice his name his badge like the car he drove also threatened disaster it was number thirteen set in a gold circle dangling from his watch chain but we had good luck to start with to our amazement the military commandant at the hotel de ville was charming and most anxious to oblige 
he gave us the coveted pass to take us through amongst the woods and the cider plantation on toward Eex somewhere and off we set spanking along merrily in the sunshine peace lay like a benediction everywhere not a whisper of war was to be heard the birds were singing we must have taken the wrong road said i and at that very moment we swung round a corner of the glade and ran slap into the middle of it all the silent army moving along grimly passionlessly to battle and overhead at a height almost invisible that inevitable keen-eyed hawk of war the aeroplane and a little later as we crested the hill the familiar sound as of the beating of carpets the banging of heavy muffled doors ahead was another hill with a castellated little town ramparted and smoking serenely in the morning shine the road clear and smooth ah cried maurice and he opened the motor out we were flying along suddenly a soldier leapt out into the road ahead brandishing a bayonet and dancing demon-wise in the dust then another and another do some on do some on maurice i yelled as i ducked and maurice obeyed just in time the first gentleman with the bayonet sprang upon our car i showed him the pass of the military commandant and told him where we wished to go anglais cried the surprised sentry with a cheerful grin and shook us warmly by the hands this way this way he piloted us into the town pointing the way with the bright steel of la rosalie and we drove with sublime sweet innocence slap into the jaws of well it might have been death it was a huge factory and as we entered the courtyard of it a splendid cavalcade of chasseurs rode gallantly out we waited for them to pass and then moved on at funeral speed to the centre of the square where stood the great general someone with his staff around him all very fine in their smart picturesque uniforms and looking more like stage soldiers than the real thing the very real thing they actually were to say that they were surprised to see us to say that we were surprised to see them would be a very mild way of putting it we were mutually amazed but before courtesies even the rapid courtesies of war could be passed we were whisked away the three of us by a super polite captain of the gendarmerie ushered into the works searched our papers taken away from us and ourselves stuck in a chill corner of the lathe shop with strict injunctions that we were not to look out of the window even should the heavens fall the automobile from the undertaker's shop at beauvais was shunted away into some obscure siding with all our traps and baggage as it vanished round the corner maurice wrung his hands he never expected to see it again nor did we our polite captain vanished and for hours and hours we stayed there kicking our fretful heels and wondering what was going to happen to us from the stores we had packed into our confiscated auto i had managed to rescue a camembert cheese which i slipped into the pocket of my overcoat my colleague who scorns such trifles had nothing 
anon the captain returned with the glad news that the general would allow us under bayonet escort to march down to the village inn to dine i wish you a pleasant meal gentlemen said he and as he bowed over my hand he sniffed looked around him and about and sniffed again we marched down the village street in the glow of the evening sun the observed of all observers with the dread bayonets of our guard twinkling at our ears we called for the finest banquet the house could provide and we had it with the two centuries as our guests they expanded delightfully as course followed course and when at last the black coffee and the soul-stirring cognac came along they were our sworn friends for ever and ever they didn't say much but they chuckled continuously chuckling still they marched us back to our fell prison we were looking forward gloomily to a comfortless night's roosting among the lathes when another message came from the kind general gentlemen you will be allowed to sleep at the inn under guard further you will be permitted to take with you your sleeping gear also your toothbrushes was there ever such a sight for laughing france two mournful prisoners being marched to bed with a sentry on each side of him a bayonet in one brown hand and a pair of fluttering pyjamas in the other my colleague's sleeping suit was a confection of vivid blue with white spots the whole townlet chortled as we passed had i the mind i could have easily escaped from my prison for my bedroom window was low and underneath it a soft high dunghill to break the fall it was too easy far too easy i remembered the exploits of tom sawyer and huck finn besides i was dead tired so i blew out the candle and crept into bed a soft feather bed and me a prisoner of war to be led out and shot perhaps next morning we slept soundly and so perhaps did the centuries tucked up in the narrow passage with their backs to our doors in the morning light back we plodded to jail another weary day among the lathes and the emery wheels the bench upon which i reclined was piled with files the waiting was so wearying that i longed for jives and fetters to manacle me closer to my dungeon here were files enough for a round dozen of jack shepherds to saw themselves free of the toughest manacles but files without fetters well this night our dinner party was memorably lively indeed now that i am away from it i can hardly believe that what happened actually did happen so strange it was the birds from the flying camp came and messed with us a merry bright-eyed little crowd first garros that marvellous juggler in the clouds who was believed to have been slain in the air in desperate conflict early in the war he came in singing his tumbled hair was wet with the evening dew the ribbon of the legion of honour proudly stamped its presence upon his breast his face was smudged and oily in his hand he carried a live pheasant how did you catch it said i in the air no monsieur in the woods 
le faisons on le mar vaut mieux que le roi qui vole he laughed a boyish laugh madame he called to our hostess i deliver this confrere of the clouds to you i have not the heart to wring its beautiful neck but i much desire it for dejeuner to-morrow pray will you do the business but out of my sight and hearing if you love me monsieur it shall be done and done it was next a famous tenor from the paris opera who charmed many londoners by his sweet voice when hammerstein held his sway in the noble building in kingsway he sang to us most beautifully la boheme tosca faust with his soldier's tunic unbuttoned at the throat and his whole soul pulsing with melody the windows were rattling at the third of the guns a few miles away our sweet singer sang on all hail thou dwelling pure and holy garros who had been tinkling on the piano with one finger swung round on his seat suddenly give us said he to the tenor the soldiers chorus no said his friend with a shrug there is no need the soldiers themselves are already giving us it come mes amis let us listen he went to the window and flung it wide we leaned out english prisoners and french soldiers alike and under a drench of starshine hearkened to the war music over the hill speaking meanwhile to one another in whispers and so to bed there in our troubled dreams to hear it again i must not forget to mention that my little box of camembert spent the night cooling on the window-sill there i left it but on the morning march back to durance madame our hostess came pattering down the road after us monsieur votre camembert said she and i slipped it back into my pocket we were wondering if we should ever see home and england again when our natty captain suddenly dropped in upon us with the gladdest of glad tidings a british staff officer was on his way to deal with our case he was here the general is sorry messieurs to have kept you here so long your case was serious because you were caught inside the prohibited zone of battle but as you are british and we are brothers now he laughed a jolly fraternal laugh fighting for the honour and the glory of england and france the general said we must find by hook or by crook a british officer to pronounce judgment we have searched long and we have searched far i am happy to tell you that we have been at last successful messieurs major thompson major thompson messieurs it was a joy to see the grey-green khaki once more in all this wilderness of blue and red it was even better to hear the pleasant cultured voice with its stern though kindly rebuke we were free again our confiscated automobile our baggage even my dear colleague's carulian starred pyjamas were handed back maurice shedding tears swished round his starting handle and sprang aboard we were off ha <laughs> ha we cleared the first line of friendly-faced soldiers 
we swung happily through the wide gateway a cry from behind a sentry one of our own champion chucklers was running shouting beckoning do some on maurice do some on we trembled what did this new turning movement mean back to our dungeon again alas we stopped with jarring breaks the sentry ran up puffing bowed to me with the dignity of an emperor and handed me a little round packet neatly wrapped monsieur said he votre camembert an interesting little souvenir of my imprisonment at french headquarters is the hotel bill it is one night's entertainment and accommodation for myself my colleague my chauffeur and the two sentries who were told off to guard us and is reproduced here hotel du chemin de fer et restaurant on face la guerre clermont was proprietaire berton du buisson telephone thang toi chambre numero toi le septembre mille neuf cent quatorze cinq dinay thang franc de bouteille saint emilion huit francs cinq cafe trois francs dix centimes une chambre six francs une chambre quatre francs deux chambres six francs trois cafe au lait deux francs vingt cinq centimes un déjeuner un franc facture total cinquante francs Tronsang Sontim. That concludes chapter twenty two of First from the Front. The section continues with L'Envoi. Here, for a time, I leave the tumultuous theatre of war. Not for long, maybe, for when the call comes, it comes with an insistence irresistible not to be denied as i write these last few lines the great battlefront has spread almost to the shores of the north sea shells are flaming over the beautiful city of antwerp and friends and foes are still hammering one another relentlessly tirelessly among the quarries and across hill and dale in the neighbourhood of my dungeon near Lassini. The outcome of it all is inevitable. There seems no doubt of that. But how long it will last, heaven alone knows. One thing is certain, certain and splendid. The courage of the Allied troops is unbounded and wonderful. Brothers in arms, brothers in adversity brothers in triumph they are fighting with a vigour that is inspired and through it all tommy our own beloved tommy brown battered drenched and draggle-tailed is maintaining the note of high courage he struck when the quick silent transports flung him out upon the french coast to let him have his little whack in the circus he is still singing high-hearted and jubilant the same old song with the same old refrain it's a long way to tipperary it's a long way to go that concludes l'envoi of first from the front and is the end of section 12, and is also the end of First from the Front by Harold Ashton.